Kelly Show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And now, Harold Perry, as Honest Harold, the homemaker. Well, there's a lot of excitement in Melrose Springs, for it's almost election time. The talk of the town is, who will be the next mayor? So far, there are two candidates for the office. Honest Harold's boss, Stanley Peabody, manager of the local radio station, and Honest Harold himself, who has been drafted by his listeners. It's morning now, and we find the people's choice at home shaving. Gosh, just can't believe it. I'm really running for mayor. Kind of scared, though. Never made a political speech in my life. Let's see. When they call on me, I'll say, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, where did I put that shaving brush? Oh, <laughs> I mean, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I really know you too well to call you that. Oop, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Better start over here. <clears throat> Fellow citizens, first I'd like to explain to you why I'm running for office. There's a group in power now that has pocketed too much of your money. Now I want a chance. Oh. <laughs> Better rehearse this. <laughs> now, let's see. If I'm elected, I promise to work to the best of my ability. And as for my opponent... Uh, ooh, suck the shaving brush in my mouth. Harold? Uh, yes, Mother? Breakfast is almost ready. How do you want your aid? <laughs> Speaking of my opponent, Stanley Peabody. He's inefficient, incompetent, and his brains are... Scrambled? His brains are scrambled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Think I'll keep that in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Station KHJP. Mr. Peabody, I'll ring his office. There you are. Ah, oh, good morning, Glory. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. What? Oh, well, I'm not mayor yet, Gloria. Well, you will be. I think you're just the kind of mayor we need. You're honest, a plain man of the people. Why, you're another Abraham Lincoln. No. He was taller. <laughs> Besides... You have awful cute dimples. Yeah, Gloria, campaigning for mayor is a very serious thing. The only reason I'm running is that so many of my listeners wrote in and asked me to. The people of Melrose Springs want an honest city government. And if I'm elected, that's what I intend to give them. Hooray! Well, thank you. Oh, Harold, last night I thought of some wonderful slogans for your campaign. You did? Yes, listen to this one. Honest Harold is awfully nice. If I can get away with it, I'll vote for him twice. Yeah. <laughs> Gloria, that's not honest And he'll pass out cigars, kiss babies with them I'd like to be the baby kissed by him <laughs> Oh my goodness Here's another one huh? Sandy Peabody is great, he thinks But confidentially, I think he's... Gloria <laughs> oh, And Harold, you know what else I'm doing? What? Well, whenever I answer the phone, if Mr. Peabody isn't around, I always say, don't vote for Stanley Peabody. He's a drip. A drip? Oh, yeah, yeah. You do, huh? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Somebody's calling now. Just uh, listen to this. Uh, Hello, Station KHJP. Don't vote for Stanley Peabody. He's a... Who's this? Mr. Peabody. Whoop. <laughs> you, you must have the wrong number. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Gee, I guess I'm an ex-PBX. <laughs> Gloria? Yes, sir? If you don't stop that campaigning on the phone, I'm going to make a switch at the switchboard. Oh, brother. That <laughs> and Hemp? Uh, yes, boss? I want a few words with you in my office. Kindly walk this way. Nobody could walk that way. <laughs> Shut the door. Yes, sir. Not from the outside. Come in here. <laughs> Hemp, are you still persisting in this idiotic idea of running against me for mayor? Well, it, yes How ridiculous Ha, ha, ha Why, you have absolutely no experience while I come from a political family huh? Why, before he came to America, my grandfather had a seat in the British Parliament He did? And after he moved over here, he still kept his seat in England <laughs> Must have been an awful strain on his suspenders. 
<laughs> Very funny. Ha, ha. Well, I liked it. Hemp, have you any idea what it takes to become mayor? Certainly. The most votes. Precisely. And in order to get those votes, you have to have an organization. Do you know what's behind me? Sure, the water cooler. <laughs> no, a political machine. And I have news for you. My uncle is supporting me. Yeah, he's been doing it for years. <laughs> my uncle has a lot of influence in this town, and I have a lot of others working for me. Do you have a machine? Well, just my 36 Essex. <laughs> Oh, you mean a machine <laughs> I'll bet you don't even have a campaign manager Well, I don't need a campaign manager The people know that I'm honest And that's all that's necessary Why don't you give up, Hemp? You haven't a chance what? Do you think the people of this town Are going to vote for an idiot, a fool, a moron? I don't know, Stanley We'll see how many votes you can get <laughs> About a campaign manager You're just trying to scare me out of running, that's all I don't need any What's that on the telephone pole? A poster with Peabody's picture There's one on the next telephone pole And the next one hm. What's that poster say? Vote for Stanley Peabody Don't derail the train of progress with a jerk Say, that's pretty clever Ooh, he means me <laughs> I guess I do need a campaign manager Now well, maybe old Doc Yak Yak, the veterinarian Can suggest somebody I'll go see him right away, as soon as I draw a mustache on Peabody's picture. <laughs> so, you uh, think you need a campaign manager, eh, Harold? Oh, I sure do, Doc. Can you suggest anybody? Well, I think I know just the fella for the job. He's intelligent, hardworking, and he's the shrewdest man I know. I'm afraid to ask you this, Doc, but who? Me. <laughs> No, fool. <laughs> Doc, I appreciate your offer, but I think I'd better try to get somebody else. All right, Harold. If you'll excuse me now, I've got some work to do. Oh, now I've hurt his feelings. Uh, I was just offering my services as an old friend, but if I'm not good enough... Doc, I didn't... That's need... all right. Uh, I'm just a nobody, just an old horse doctor. Doc, old horse, uh, old <laughs> The animals love me. Huh? Why, there's not a cocker spaniel in town that wouldn't share his last can of Red Heart with me. <laughs> Doc, i do anything for you. You know that. You can be my campaign manager. Well, okay, Harold, if you insist. <clears throat> well, candidate Hemp, let's get down to business. Uh, got your campaign speech? Well, sort of. Well, the first thing you got to do is try it out. On you? No, on my animals. What? Best way to tell if your speech sounds sincere. The animals can spot a phony a mile away. But, Doc... Come on. I'll take you into your audience. Okay. <laughs> what an audience. Quiet. Quiet, voters. Voters. <laughs> All right, fellow citizens. I want to introduce our next mayor, Honest Harold Hemp. <laughs> Eloise, no heckling. All right, Harold, start your speech. And don't forget, be sincere. Sincere? This is ridiculous. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, what's the matter with that baby goat? Well, she's hurt. You just said ladies and gentlemen, but you left out the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and young goats. Never have I seen such intelligent faces. Harold, you're not being sincere uh, And with your support, fellow voters I'll defeat my opponent, Stanley Peabody Why, it'll be like leading a lamb to the slaughter oh. Harold, I'm sorry, fellas oh. Fellas uh. Oh, there's the phone I'll be right back Okay, Doc I didn't mean to insult you, little animals Well, I love animals, honest You can ask my cat Harold, huh? Harold, I got some bad news. What is it? That was Gloria at the station. What? Stanley Peabody has hired a big sound truck. He's going to campaign around town in it this afternoon. Oh, that's going to cost me a lot of votes. Oh, not while I'm your manager. 
Harold, I got an idea. What's that? Yes, sir. My brain's ticking away every second. Stop taking bows, Doc. <laughs> Tell me your idea. <laughs> All right, Harold. I'm going to build you a float on my buggy out in the barn. A float? Mm hmm. I'll paint some signs on it and hitch it to my horse, Silver Moon. Then we'll follow Peabody Sound Truck all over town. <laughs> That'll steal his thunder. Say, I think you got something there, Doc. Sure. Now, uh, we've only got an hour. You better go to the marshal's office and get a parade permit. Yeah, all right, Doc. And you'd better hurry, Mayor Hemp. Mayor? Yeah. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> and thank you, voters. <laughs> Uh, better hurry. Parade starts in an hour. That Pete the Marshal is so slow, it'll probably take him that long just to make out the permit. Oh, my goodness. Pete's old father, Cleet, is here today. He's slower than Pete. Cleet, I want you to do something for me right away. Now, just a minute, Harold. We've got a new system here. What? Take a number there, and I'll call you when it's your turn. Oh, <laughs> all right. Now, take a seat over there. That's it. Now, what's your number? 65. Number 65! <laughs> what a system. <laughs> now, look here, Cleet. I'm in a hurry. I want a permit for a float this afternoon. Uh, now, now just, just a minute, Harold. I have to fill out a form. Oh, my goodness. Name, please. Margaret O'Brien. <laughs> Margaret O'Brien, uh, let me write that down. When did you cut off your curls, Margaret? <laughs> Very funny. How old are you, Harold? Well, I'm nearing 40. Nearing ah. 40? Huh. <laughs> you must be on your second time around. <laughs> Come on, please. I've got to have that permit. All right. What year do you want it for? This year, this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, huh? Let me write that down. Oh. <laughs> Get a move on, Cleet. Uh, where are you going to use the permit? Right here in Melrose Springs. Melrose Springs. Let me write that down. <coughs> Hold it, Newt. There's no lake around here. Now, what do I need a lake for? For the boat. Boat? Oh, my goodness. It's not a boat. It's a float. <laughs> oh, I thought you wanted to float a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd have to start all over again. Take another number, Harold, and I'll call you. Pete, there's something I'd like to call you. I bet I know what it is. <laughs> but I ain't gonna write that down. <laughs> Get that guy down. Uh. to play bingo with Cleet, but I finally got the permit. Oh, good, good. Well, the float's all finished. <laughs> Ain't she a beaut? Yes, Doc, and we better hurry. But there's my master touch. That picture on the side there. Where? There, there. Miss Rheingold of 1950. <laughs> she isn't running for mayor. No, but she looks better in a bathing suit than you do. <laughs> Come on, Doc. Peabody's sound truck goes out any minute. And doesn't my horse, Silver Moon, look cute with that bow on her? <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Doc, there goes Peabody's sound truck. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's get aboard. Hurry up. Oh, this will fix Peabody all right. Shrewdest thing you ever did, Harold, making me your campaign man. Yeah, all right. Come on. All right, hold on, Harold. Here, here we go. Hey, uh, giddy up, Silver Moon. Come on, girl. <laughs> oh. Now what's the matter, Doc? I guess I built the float too wide. Won't go through the barn door. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, come here, I Harold. The float's collapsing. Oh, my Harold. You got your head stuck right through that picture, Miss Rheingold. Uh. <laughs> look pretty good in that bathing suit. <laughs> Doc, you're fired. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You're fired, too.
We'll return for the second act of our story, Honest Harold, in just a moment. Are you interested in going into the perfume business? Then you won't want to miss Bing Crosby tonight when he tries his sales pitch on his guest, Claudette Colbert. Yes, be sure to join Bing Crosby and Claudette Colbert later tonight over most of these same stations. And by the way, listen for Harold Perry's important announcement at the end of our show. And now back to Honest Harold, the homemaker. Harold's campaign for mayor isn't going too well. He fell out with Doc Yancey, his campaign manager, when he fell out of the float. It's the following morning now. Our unhappy candidate is just eating breakfast when... Harold! Uh, what is it, Mother? Oh, look what's in the morning paper. Well, let me see. Stanley Peabody, candidate for mayor, will speak at the high school tonight. His subject will be, What is Good City Government? Show off. Oh, read the rest of it, Harold. Huh? Mr. Peabody challenges his opponent, Harold Hemp, to meet him there and speak on the same subject. If he dares. Whoop. Hmm, I suppose he thinks you're afraid to get up there and speak. Yeah, and he wouldn't dare say that if it wasn't true. <laughs> now, Harold, you're a fine public speaker. Why, remember the time in the eighth grade when you delivered that recitation, a message to Garcia? Yes, Mother. The time I delivered the message, Garcia was gone. <laughs> mother, I can't do it. Oh, now, you mustn't be afraid, son. Now, why don't you sit down right now and write that speech? Mother, I don't know anything about city government. I thought I'd find out about that after I got elected. <laughs> I know. You could go to the public library. They must have books on city government. Say, I bet they do. Oh. I'm down to the library right now. That's the spirit, my boy. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, oh, Harold, uh, Harold, as long as you're going to the library, you might as well return that book you've been reading. Oh, good idea. And here it is, too. The Bobsy Twins in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder where they'll go next. <laughs> like a morgue in this library. This is where they probably buried Carnegie. <laughs> and there's dear Miss Witherspoon behind the desk. Hey, good morning, Miss Witherspoon. I'd like... Shh. No loud talking in the library. Oh, 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 excuse me. I'll be with you in a minute. All right. Uh, <coughs> Quiet! <laughs> now, what is it? I want to get a... I want to get a book. The children's section is right over there. <laughs> you see, I'm going to run for mayor, and I want to read a book on city government. We just had one book on that subject, City Government, by Timothy Hargrove. It's on that shelf right over there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Shh, on your toes. Oh, so you think I am a ballet dancer? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Yeah, here's the shelf. Let's see here. What's that? <laughs> Somebody's got a slow leak. <laughs> oh, oh, it's Miss Witherspoon. Come here. All right. Tippy toe. Tippy toe. Oh. Wait till I get elected mayor. I'll demote her to the nonfiction section. <laughs> Yes, Miss Witherspoon? I just remembered. I checked out that book on city government this morning. You did? Who got it? Maybe I can borrow it from him. Stanley Peabody. Stanley Peabody? Quiet! Oh, quiet yourself. <laughs> Good <Goodbye. laughs> sit here in the park all day. What am I going to do? Can't show up tonight with no speech. I don't know why I wanted to run for mayor anyway. Uh, pardon me, sir. What? Have I the honor of addressing, perchance, honest Harold Hemp? Why, yes. The candidate for mayor of this fair city? Yeah, that's right. Well, it is a lucky, lucky day. <laughs> I happened to be in this vicinity a few days, saw your photograph in the paper, 
and remarked to myself, I'd like to help that man get elected in the interests of good government. Well, thank you. Uh, are you in the political game, Mr. Uh... A very astute question. I have been a political advisor for years. Uh, my card. Oh, thanks. Careful, the ink isn't dry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, J.P. Camroy, political consultant. Headquarters over Jimmy's pool room. <laughs> oh, just a uh, temporary quarter. Oh, of course. Now, if there's any advice I could give your campaign manager... Well, uh, uh, I don't have one right now. You don't have a campaign manager. Tis a lucky, lucky day. It is? J.P. Camroy hereby tenders you his services as campaign manager in the interests of good government. Uh, but, Mr. Camroy... Now, my first official duty is to peruse your speech for tonight. Uh, we've got to look out for dangling participants. <laughs> they, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I haven't prepared my speech yet. You haven't prepared your speech? Yeah. Oh, tis a lucky, lucky day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a fate I just... Happen to have a speech with me that is suitable for the occasion. Oh? And I am going to let you have it in the interests of good government. Oh, well, thank you very much. The only cost to you will be a slight typing fee. Yeah, oh, well, I don't have much money on me, just $9.60. That is the typing fee. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a coincidence. <laughs> May I see the speech first? Certainly. Here it is. Yeah, let's see here. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created... E Say, this is pretty good. <laughs> Where was I? Oh. That they are endowed with certain unalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of hap... Wait a minute. This is the Declaration of Independence. You guessed it, and what a speech. Yeah, but this hasn't got anything to do with city government. Exactly. You let your opponent put the audience to sleep with the dry stuff, taxes, the budget... Then you give them the Declaration of Independence. You're in. I am? And look who wrote your speech. Yeah? Uh? Thomas Jefferson. Ben Franklin. Yeah? Where can you get writers like that for $9? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you got a point there, all right. Why? <laughs> a thing like this could sweep you into office. You know, J.P., I believe you're right. Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget the typing fee. Uh, oh, yes, excuse me. Uh, here you are, $9.60. Thank you. It is a lucky, lucky day. It sure is. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Uh, sure was a lucky, lucky day when I ran into old J.P. Pretty clever of him thinking of that Declaration of Independence. I got it cheap, too, only $9.60. Well, I guess I'm a real politician now. Sweater vest, got a pocket full of cigars and everything. Hey, Harold. Oh, hello, Doc. Have a cigar. Well, thanks. I don't smoke myself, but my goat likes them. <laughs> They're kind of his T-zone. <laughs> Good. Harold, when I heard about you getting trapped into that speech tonight, I thought I'd let bygones be bygones. I may not be your campaign manager anymore, but Doc Yancey isn't one to desert a friend in need. Well, thank you a lot, Doc, but I, I don't really need any help. Huh? Aren't you worried about making that speech? Worried? Nah. Well, what kind of a speech is it? Well, it's a sort of a um, declaration of independence. Who wrote it? Oh, a couple of ghost writers. <laughs> <laughs> See you tonight, Doc. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder about Harold. Honest boy, though. <laughs> Good afternoon, Harold. Oh, Gloria, have a cigar. I mean, how are you? Oh, fine. Gee, I thought you'd be home writing your speech. It's all written, Gloria. Did you write it all by yourself? Well, a couple of fellows helped me. B. Franklin and T. Jefferson. Local boys? Lo well, <laughs> oh, they're from out of town. Philadelphia. <laughs> Hemp, what are you doing out here? Well, Peabody, old body, have a cigar. No, thank you. Huh? Can't stand a rope from hemp, eh? <laughs> so you're going to show up tonight, hemp. 
Well, I'm warning you. You don't know what this is going to cost you. Sure I do. Nine dollars and sixty cents. <laughs> what? Yeah, skip it, Stanley. Yes, sir, you're in for a big surprise. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, and you're going to be the one that's burning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> People here tonight. Look at Stanley sitting on the other side of that stage with his long legs crossed. He's wearing tartan garters. The dude. Oh, there's Mother down in the audience. Hello, Mother. I bet she'd be proud of me tonight. The meeting will please come to order. Uh, Mr. Honeycutt, hope he cuts it short. Thank you. As chairman of the Melrose Spring Civic League, I want to welcome you all to the school auditorium. Tonight, we're going to hear our two candidates for mayor speak on the subject of good city government. That's what he thinks. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> that reminds me of a little witticism. <laughs> oh, brother, he's going to tell one of his Rotary Club jokes. <laughs> Here it is. <clears throat> Why should some of our politicians go back to school? So they get to know some principles. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brother, Thomas Jefferson didn't write that. Our first speaker will be Mr. Stanley Peabody. Oh, he must have all his relatives here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Come on, Stanley, let's get that tired old speech over with. Ladies and gentlemen, I prepared a speech on city government for tonight. We know that. But at the last moment, I decided that no words of mine could be as eloquent as the great American document I'm going to read to you. What's this? We hold these truths to be self-evident <laughs> that all men are created equal. Oop, that's my speech. That they are endowed with certain unalienable rights. I've been framed. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm sunk. Wonder if I could sneak out of here. That to secure these rights. What's that? Look at all those doors. Where did they come from? That to secure these rights. Doggies, little, little, get down, get down. Wonder who let him out of the pond. Hi, Harold. Oh, it's Doc Yancey, I'll bet he... Good old Doc. All right, now, quiet, brother, quiet. Well, we might as well adjourn. It looks like the meeting has gone to the dogs. <laughs> Doc. Yes, what is it, Harold? Thanks, old friend. That was a pretty clever idea, letting the dogs out of the pond to save me. Wasn't thinking of you, Harold. Just thought it was time those dogs got out for a little constitutional. Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> Look here, Hemp. Oh, hello, Stanley. That was an underhanded trick, stopping my speech that way. And I paid J.P. Camroy $25 for that idea. You did? I only paid him nine sixty. dollars <laughs> <laughs> It was a lucky, lucky day. <laughs> You have just heard the Harold Perry Show, Honest Harold, who returns in just a moment with an important announcement. The supporting players tonight included Catherine Card, Ken Peters, Leo Cleary, Ruth Parrott, and John McIntyre, and featured Gloria Holliday as Gloria and Joseph Kearns as old Doc Yak Yak. Norman MacDonald directed, and the music was composed and conducted by Jack Meekin. Honest Harold, created by Harold Perry, was written by Gene Stone, Jack Robinson, and Bill Danch. Now back to Harold Perry. Ooh, that's me. <laughs> well, Bob, for the people who missed it, I'm hunting for a laughing lady, someone we can invite to appear on our show. Her laugh will enter her in the Honest Harold Laugh Contest, and it begins right in her hometown. So, ladies, if the laugh contest is being conducted in your city, please enter, and you may be here with us some Wednesday night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay tuned now for the Bing Crosby Show, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Oh, that's a good show. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Say 
Savings Bank of Australia, the bank for all the family, takes pleasure in presenting the show for all the family, Night with Dexter. For a car or a bike or just a rainy day, be sure to stay the friendly Commonwealth way. So listen to this advice and start right today to bank Commonwealth say Commonwealth Bank Commonwealth now. And for some families, life is nothing but beer and skittles, but not for the Duttons. Something always comes along to break the monotony of any given week. Let's take any week at random and see what I mean. We'll select one, oh, quite recently. It's a Monday evening at the dinner table, and everything appears to be quite normal. Ashley, don't eat with your elbows on the table. Ashley, did you hear what I said? Ashley, your sister spoke to you. I know, Mum, but it didn't register. If you or Dad tell me to take my elbows off the table, I'll do it, but not for compost. You do as your sister says. Uh, shall I take it, then, that you wish me to remove my elbows from the table? Son, you can take it any way you like, but if they aren't off the table in one second, you'll be sore well below the elbows. <laughs> They're off, as they say when the barrier goes up. Ashley, I'm getting a little tired of your attitude around this house. You're getting much too big for your boots. Oh, he's a hopeless goon. Or as we girls would say, he's an apple. Oh, I am not an apple. Whether you are or not, you're beginning to give your family the pip. <laughs> anyway, if you've finished your dinner, you'd better start on your homework. Dad, I already started on my homework this afternoon, but that's all I did, start on it. Miss Dooley gave me a mathematical problem. I, I just can't figure it out. What? Well, you better start figuring it out right away. Your teacher wouldn't give you problems you haven't already been shown. Well, I guess I didn't catch on during the lesson. Miss Dooley's a holy terror, and I'm frightened to ask her questions. Oh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Well, Daddy, I must stand up for my brother where Miss Dooley's concerned. She's my maths teacher, too, and this term I haven't been hip to her at all. Well, you must have been daydreaming all day in school, probably thinking about Martin Parker instead of paying attention. Oh, Daddy, that isn't true. And it doesn't account for me, Dad. I can't stand Martin Parker. I'm quite sure this Miss Dooley does her best to impart knowledge, but it's just unfortunate she's got two pupils who are numbskulls. There's no life in their heads. Oh, gee, Dad, my head's alive. I'm not a dead-end kid. <laughs> Janie, where are you going? I'm getting my homework book. I want Daddy to see what I've got to do tonight. That's good. I'm anxious to see it. Any problem is very simple if you look at it intelligently and use a little common sense. Uh, yes, Dad. Maybe you can help us both, hmm? It seems like I'll have to. Here, Daddy. Have a look at the one on the top of the page and tell me how you'd start to go about that. Uh, well, there's nothing to it, I'm sure, once it's analysed. Uh, uh, Are you analysing it, dear? Read it out. Uh, 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 yes, read it out. Uh, it. Uh, you can read it, can't you, Dad? Uh, actually, oh, will you keep <laughs> out of this... Go on, Daddy. I, I'm just looking at it, and it looks perfectly straightforward to me. Uh, uh, what, uh, on a full tide, a boat 16 feet long was tied fore and aft by lengths of rope, each 14 feet long, to two posts 30 feet apart. Uh, two feet six inches of each rope is used in the tying. The height of the tide is six feet, and the water drops at the rate of six inches per hour. How much slack rope will there be at the end of the boat at 7.15 p.m. if the vessel had been made fast at 5.30 p.m.? Uh, Perfectly straightforward, is it, dear? Uh, sure, just like how long is a piece of string? Well, I can't make head and tail of it. Well, I don't see why not, Janie. The boat is 16 feet long, and the ropes are... 14 feet long. I'm not allowing for knots, which take up two foot six each. Yeah, well, just a minute. Uh, now, uh, let's get this straight. On, on a full tide, a boat is tied to a post and... and to two posts, Daddy. The high tide is six feet. Yeah, I know that, Jesse, but wait a minute. The boat's 14 feet long. 16 That's... feet long. The ropes are 14 feet. All up the winner of the Melbourne Cup. All up the... <laughs> Will you be quiet... <laughs> now, look, Janie, there's nothing complicated about this problem at all. Uh... 
Now, I, I've come to a conclusion. It's your homework, and it wouldn't be fair if I help you with it any further. <laughs> any further? So far, you've only read the question. Well, I, I've broken it up into pieces for you, and it'd be cheating if I went any further. Oh, Dexter, that's not true. A father's entitled to show his children how to do things. You don't have to give Janie the actual answer, even if you had it. Look, oh, I've so told you to keep your... Keep right out of this, Ash. Now, wait a minute, if... I suppose if I have to substitute for Miss Dooley, then I have to. Uh, we'll go into the living room and do this while your mother clears the table. Good. And the Wilmots are calling in in about an hour, remember? The time is now 6.20. We'll have this little maths problem sorted out and mastered by 6.30. Yeah, we sure will, Mum. About half an hour before breakfast. Yeah, about... Oh, oh gee. <laughs> There's no doubt about it, teenagers, like other people, have their problems. And that is true not only when they're at school, but afterwards as well. At the present time, many young people have the problem of settling into their first jobs. And to those young people, I'd like to say how important it is to open a Commonwealth Savings Bank account now. Most of you will have quite a lot of money in your pay envelope each week. Take my advice and don't waste it. If you do waste it, then believe me, you could regret it later, because in a few years' time you'll need quite a lot of money. On the other hand, if you open a Commonwealth Savings Bank account and save something every payday, you'll soon have an amount you can do something with. If you save only one pound a week, it means 600 pounds in 10 years. And one pound per week is less than three shillings a day. So I do urge you to open a Commonwealth Savings Bank account next payday. Concentrate on putting a fixed amount into your account each week. Join the hundreds of thousands of other young people who week by week bank Commonwealth. The high tide is six feet and the water drops six inches every minute. Every hour. Well, wait a minute. That means the boat drops six inches every hour, which means at 7.15 p.m. it's dropped... What time did it start dropping? 5.15. 5.30. 5.30. All right. The high tide was 5.30, and the difference between 5.30 and, 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 and 7.30 is two hours. But it's not 7.30. It's 7.15. Which makes the difference one and three-quarter hours. Yeah, well, exactly. So there we've got it. One and three-quarter hours. Uh, w would that be the answer? It's not the answer. The answer's got to be how much slack rope. Oh, well, let's put down so far what we've got. Well, uh, well no, I, 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 I suggest you. Slack rope left. According to me, the boat would be hanging in midair. That's because your calculations are all wrong. Look, it's almost 11 o'clock. Now, do let's forget about it. Oh, yeah. Clara, I've made up my mind on one thing. I'm going to phone this Miss Doodlebug right now and tell her from me that Miss there is... Oh, Daddy, you wouldn't. You wouldn't phone her. Please, Pop. She'll go off Pop and boy, can she go off Pop, Pop. Oh, I think the woman should be phoned and Dexter should give her a piece of his mind. He hasn't got much to spare, but he should still give her a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Dooley is not going to be phoned this evening, and that's for certain. She'd be in a dreadful mood at this hour of the night. Well, she's in a dreadful mood any hour of the day or night. Oh, Dad, please don't have an argument with Miss Dooley. If you phone her, our lives won't be worth living. Oh, please, Dad. No, no, I'm sorry, children. I've made up my mind. I have quite a few words to say to this teacher, if she can call herself a teacher. I'm with you, Dexter. In fact, I'll stand by you when you get in touch with her. Uh, Dad, may I just say a... No, Ashley, you may not. But, Daddy, I'll never be able the to... The subject is closed. KG and I will phone this Miss Dooley from the office tomorrow. Oh, no. Suffering jellyfish. Dexter, if you insist on contacting the woman, well, the least you might do is phone from here when the children are home so they can hear what you say. There's no need for them that to hear what it is. fair enough, Dexter. We'll come in here together after work tomorrow and make the phone call. I'll give you some hints what to say. Oh, oh brother. Now, Kimberly, I think you should keep your big nose out of it. In fact, I don't believe a man should phone Miss Dooley. It should be a woman. Now, Jessie, dear, why don't you do it? Oh, no, I no, I couldn't. I'm not a good talker. Oh, well, then how about me? I know how to talk. <laughs> Clara, it's all settled. Dexter and I are making the phone call. You might know how to talk, but you haven't got a clue how to stop. Oh. oh, 
Oh, Jesse, dear, what's the time? Oh, it's almost four o'clock. Hmm. So we should be almost home from school. Oh, if only I could think of some way to stop our impetuous husbands making this stupid phone call. Oh, we've been trying to think for hours, but it's no use. Maybe they'd change their minds about it. Mm, we can't take a chance on that, dear. Janie and Ashley pleaded with me this morning to work out some kind of a plan. And it's the first time I'm completely at a loss. No, Clara, there is one way, but it means telling a lie. A lie? <gasps> oh, how dreadful. <laughs> Sounds good, dear. What do we do? <laughs> well, supposing when the men get here, we say we've already phoned Miss Dooley and discussed the question of mathematics. Hmm. Oh, no. No, 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 dear, no. It wouldn't work. Dexter and Kimberly are actually looking forward to blowing their trumpets. They'll still want to ring and have their say. <gasps> Jessie, I've got it. I've got the perfect plan. Dear. I knew you'd come up with something. Hi, Mummy, darling. We're home. Hi, Mum. Hi, Mrs. Walmart. Oh, children, children, you're just in the nick of time to hear my dastardly plan. Ah, oh, there you are, compost. Didn't I tell you Mrs. Wilmot would have an idea when we got home? Oh, Mrs. Wilmot, you're a genius. Miss Dooley's been screaming today about several of us not being able to do our homework. Right. Now, we haven't much time before Kimberly and your father get here, dears, so this is what is going to happen. When the men insist on phoning Miss Dooley, you children act as though you're resigned to it. So resigned, in fact, that Ashley will do the actual dialing of the phone number. What? what me? me? Dial Miss Dooley? After putting up with Miss Dooley's dial all week? <laughs> Ashley, please listen. The reason you dial is that you don't dial your teacher's number, dear, but accidentally on purpose dial mine. Yours? Clara, why yours? Because I'm going to be Miss Dooley. Leaping lizards. Well, I could even be one of those if I had to. <laughs> now, what does it matter who Dexter and Kimberly speak to as so long as they speak to someone? This way, everyone's going to be satisfied and nobody's going to get hurt. It's a mess. Idea. Yeah, I reckon it's the most. Dad and Mr. Wilmot don't know, Miss Dooley. Clara, it's cheating. Yes, dear, but it's only cheating to be kind. Our husbands don't understand what damage they can do by antagonizing the real Miss Dooley. And it's better to cheat a little than to make the children's lives miserable. Absolutely. Positively. Well, I don't know. Then it's all settled, Jesse. Three yeses against one doubtful. Jesse, you're overruled. And now I must disappear. I don't want to be here when the men get home. Oh, Mrs. Wilmot, mm -hmm. how about your voice? Supposing they recognize your voice. Oh, they won't, dear. I'm an old actress, remember. Yes, well, not so old. <laughs> but I'm a past actress. And I'm sure Mrs. Wilmot can put it over. I tell you truly, and no fooly, I will pass for your Miss Dooley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clara, you are a scream. I won't take no for an answer, and I'm telling you, Jesse. I, I know you and the children are going to try to dissuade me from phoning this mathematics teacher, but I'm going to do it, and right now, aren't I, KG? I do think it's for the best. Well, we don't intend trying to dissuade you. The children are quite resigned to it. If it must be done, it must. Father, we understand. In fact, I'll dial a number for you. You... Miss Dooley's number? I'll, uh... <clears throat> I'll dial the number right away. Good boy, Ashley, you do that. This is the woman's home number. Yes, this is the woman's home number. Now, Dexter, don't be too aggressive. Oh, Jesse, I won't be. <coughs> hello? Oh, uh, 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 hello. Uh, is that Miss Dooley? Oh, speaking. Uh, <coughs> uh, this is Dexter Dutton, uh, father of Janie and Ashley Dutton. Oh, how nice. I don't believe we've ever met Mr. Dutton, <laughs> but you're too... Charming children. They're my favorite pupils. Dexter, get to the point. Yeah, all right. Uh, uh, oh, is that so, Miss Dooley? Mm -hmm. uh, for what reason do I owe the pleasure of this call, Mr. Dutton? Uh, well, I, uh, I, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Miss Dooley, uh, I have been a trifle concerned about the difficult mathematical problems Janie and Ashley have been getting for homework lately. Oh, oh I don't blame you at all. Some of the problems are ridiculously complicated. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're part of our curriculum. Uh, they're part of our curriculum. Uh, well, they're in our books. <laughs> See? And we're obliged to pass them on to the poor dear students. She sounds like a nut. <laughs> Get away from the phone. Yes, well, uh... uh you see, Miss Dooley, I saw one last night about a boat tied to a couple of posts, and I did Oh, think wasn't that... that a little wish? 
Oh, yes, you don't took me hours to work it out myself. I don't blame any child for ignoring it completely. She is a nut. <laughs> you be quiet. Hey, oh, no, no, not you, Miss Dooley. I, I, I was speaking to one of my noisy neighbors, Mr. Wilmot. Oh, Mr. Wilmot? Oh, do tell me. Is he that rather fat man? <laughs> you know, the, the, the fat man, you know, who's married to that charming, good-looking woman named Sarah. Now I know she's a nut. <laughs> hey, you, will you keep out of this? Uh, Miss Dooley, uh, I must say I am rather surprised to find you agree with me about the difficulty of these mathematical problems. Oh, oh, Mr. Dutton, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, tell your darling children not to concern themselves about them. In future, I'll endeavor to devote more time showing my pupils how to tear these ridiculous problems to pieces. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, You've been most considerate and cooperative, and uh, would you please accept my sincere appreciation for your thoughtfulness? Oh! Not at all, dear man. I simply adored having the chat. Now, pip, pip, toodle uh, 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 Pip, pip, uh, toodle uh, Well, it's over. Yes, it's all over, and I think you'll agree I handle it most efficiently. Children, your worries are over. The whole thing was just a, a piece of cake. A piece of cake's right. That dame's nuttier than a fruitcake. <laughs> Although Dexter thinks he's doing everything for the best, I think everyone would be better off if he left it to Janie and Ashley. I say that because most young people these days have their heads screwed on the right way. I had a good example of that only last week. Coming to town in the bus, I heard two young chaps, about 21, talking. One said to the other, You know any way I can get a lot of money quickly? And the other replied, Well, I've tried a few things. I'm satisfied the best way to get money is to save it. I tried the GGs and the lottery. Got nowhere. So I opened a Commonwealth Savings Bank account, and in the past 12 months I saved 200 quid. And with any sort of luck, I'll save more than that this year. Now, that is not only an example of good sense. It shows what can be achieved by regular saving. If you want to have money... Open the Commonwealth Savings Bank account next payday. Visit the Commonwealth Savings Bank each week. Get the saving habit and week by week, Bank Commonwealth. Good morning, Jessie dear. May I come in? Oh, hello, Clara. Or should I say good morning, Miss Dooley? (laughs) Oh, Jessie, I didn't dare come back in last night after the phone call. I was afraid I might burst out laughing and give the show away. Clara, you did a magnificent job. Dexter sincerely believes he handled everything beautifully. (laughs) He didn't show any signs of knowing it was a hoax, dear. the slightest, Lordy Kimberly. Mm, Oh, I'm not so certain about Kimberly. He gave me some funny looks during dinner last night. Oh, you imagined it. And you've made... Made my children very happy. No. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Clara. Hello? Oh, hello. My name's Agatha Dooley. We haven't met, but I'm the mathematics teacher. Uh, uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, would you excuse me for a moment while I, I, I turn off the radio? Certainly. Clara, you'll never believe. I can hear every word there. Speak of the devil and up she pops. Well, go ahead and see what you want. Uh, <clears throat> I'm awfully sorry, Miss Dooley, but I couldn't hear for the radio. That's quite all right. Mrs. Dutton, I'm making it my duty in this term to call on the fathers of my pupils and regarding homework and the importance of doing it satisfactorily. Uh, would it be convenient for me to call at your house this evening? Christopher Columbus. <laughs> the, 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 this evening? Well, uh, if uh, tonight isn't convenient, you you will just name the evening, and I'll arrange my plans to suit. Oh, well, I I, I I guess tonight's as good as this, any other night. Are you sure? Oh yes, yes, yes. We'll look forward to seeing you, Miss Dooley. Like we're looking forward to old age. Good. <laughs> then I'll see you about seven. Goodbye for now, Mrs. Dutton. Bye, Miss Dooley. Oh, oh, oh. Jessie. Dear, what have I let you in for now? My stupid plans have backfired again. Oh, it's not your fault, Clara. You weren't to know we'd hear from the real Miss Dooley. Mm. The poor-
point is, what do we now do about it? Well, there's only one thing to do, dear. We must phone our husbands at the office and tell them last night's phone was a complete hoax. We'll ring them in a few minutes, just as soon as we work out the best way to break the news. Dexter, whether you believe me or not, I'll bet my life it's true. The more I got to thinking about it last night, the surer I became. But why would they want to pull a silly stunt like that? Why Why would Clara pretend to be Miss Dooney? Because she's full of silly stunts. She probably talked Jesse into it. Didn't you notice how young Ashley dialed the number before you could get to the phone? Yeah, yeah now that you mention it, it was rather strange for him to be so anxious. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Kimberly Dell. Clara here. Oh, it's you, Clara. I'm glad you phoned, because I want you to know Dexter and I are wide awake to your silly prank last night. You are? Oh, but that's wonderful, dear. I'm so glad to hear it. Now, that's the main reason I phoned you. The other is I want you to tell Dexter that the real Miss Dooley is calling to see him at home tonight. Oh. Oh, she is. All right, dear, I'll tell him. Is that all? Yes, Kimberly, dear, that's all. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Did Clara say Miss Dooley was calling to see me tonight? That's what the lady said. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you know who Miss Dooley will be. One of Clara's brainless women friends pretending to be a school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your wife's up to another one of her uh, stunts. Definitely. When Clara starts, it, she never knows when to stop. Yeah. And I'm supposed to be the bunny being taken for a ride. Uh. Well, what do you suggest I do? You'll do exactly as I do. We'll let Clara and your family think we're really expecting Miss Dooley. But when this amateur actress arrives tonight, we'll make her hair stand on end. That's if she's got me. <laughs> oh, good evening, Miss Dooley. Won't you please come in? Thank you, Jenny. Oh, good evening, Miss Dooley. Ashley. Hello, Miss Dooley. I, I'm Jessie Dutton, and this is my neighbour, Clara Wilmot. How do you do? How do you do? My husband and Mr. Wilmot. Hi there, kiddo. Oh. <laughs> I say, I'm pleased to meet you. So you're old Aggie Dooley. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Sit down, Ag. <laughs> I think this chair's strong enough to take it. Kimberly! Uh, Dooley, old girl, I understand you're a, a teacher of rheumatics. What? Daddy! What's the matter with you? Miss Dooley teaches us mathematics. Oh, I must be having a nightmare. Oh, please, will you forgive my husband? They must both have got a touch of the sun, dear. Now, tell me, Ag, how's your boat going? The one that goes up and down with the tide. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, the one with the slack rope dangling everywhere. Oh, yes. I have no intention of staying here and being insulted. Ah, now, wait a minute, Miss Dooley. You can't blame us for having a crack at some of your silly mathematical problems. I don't like what my children have been getting for their homework, and on behalf of my family, I'm revolting. You certainly are. And your plump friend is even more revolting. Dexter, do you realize what you're doing to your own children? Oh, Jesse, I'm trying to save them from being victimized by this fugitive from figures. <laughs> you know, I'll bet she doesn't even know how to add up a single column of digits. Well, I'm leaving this house and beginning. You'll hear more of this. Goodbye. Oh, that's oh, no! oh, oh, the old, the old right. bag's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you might say Miss Dooley has bamoolied. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, look, KG, she left her purse behind. What do you know? And it's got initials on it. Uh, now we might fathom who that woman really is. A.D. A.D. Uh, well, it certainly doesn't stand for Agatha Dooley. No, it's it certainly... It, it, oh. <laughs> Look, girls, we can't do any more than we've done, now can we, KG? No. Dexter, I'll never forgive you. Not I, you, Kimberly. Oh, Mummy, it's all right now. 
Daddy and Mr. Wilmot were at the school for a full hour today apologizing to Miss Dooley. Yeah, sure they were. Miss Dooley told me she understands the whole mistake. Haven't we just come back from apologizing again? Tonight's apology really clinched the deal. I vote we drop the matter completely. Here, here. Well, I guess we were all somewhat equally to blame. But, Jesse, our husband shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. Clara, let's leave it at that. We're all to blame, but now it's all cleared up. Good, it's all cleared up. Ashley, don't tell me you're still doing your homework. Yes, Dad. I've got one maths problem here, and I'm just not with it. Well, you should be. What is it? If it takes nine men six days to dig a round hole five feet in diameter by three feet deep, how many days will it take four men to dig a round hole 40 feet in diameter by 15 feet deep? Well, son, that isn't a difficult problem. If you take the first number of days and divide it into the second number of days... There's no you'll... second number of days to get the answer. No, no, no. The way to do it is to start with the diameter. No, then no, wait a minute. I, I've got it now. You've got to subtract the depth of the first hole from the depth of the other hole. Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry about it. 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 again. And like the man who digs a hole and fills it in again, Dexter and KG won't get anywhere. That is, unless their arithmetic has improved since the last time. And speaking of digging holes and getting nowhere reminds me of people who do not save. They end each year just as poor as when they started. On the other hand, people who save regularly in a Commonwealth Savings Bank account get ahead and always have ready money. For instance, The people who buy their own businesses, the travellers who go abroad, the people who are free of money troubles, and the people who have the good things of life are people who have saved. So if you want to get ahead and really go places, open a Commonwealth Savings Bank account. Make a trip each week to the Commonwealth Savings Bank and save something from each pay. Then at the end of this year, you'll have quite a nice sum of money in your Commonwealth account. Start saving now, and week by week, Bank Commonwealth. Life with Dex is produced by Noel Judd and written by Willie Fennell. If money can buy it, saving will get it, so Bank Commonwealth now. For a car, or a bike, or just a rainy day. Be sure to save the friendly Commonwealth way. So listen to this advice and start right today. To bank, Commonwealth save, Commonwealth bank, Commonwealth now. And this is John Dunn inviting you to enjoy life with Dexter at the same time next week from this station. And remember, you'll always enjoy life with a Commonwealth Savings Bank account. Charles Farrell, transcribed in Hollywood. Margie's father, Vern Albright, is an investment counselor with the Wall Street firm of Honeywell and Todd. It's a good job, but it isn't always peaches and cream. In fact, sometimes the cream gets a little sour. To show you what we mean, let's drop in on Vern, who has just been summoned to Mr. Honeywell's office. Uh, you sent for me, Mr. Honeywell? Uh, yes, all right. An important client of ours is coming to town. You remember her, the wealthy widow, Mrs. Purvis? Oh, Sure. Laryngitis Curtis. Laryngitis? Why do you call her that? Because she's a pain in the neck. Oh, now, let's not be harsh on the woman. Just because she happens to be a little grouchy and ill-tempered and loud-mouthed and all is complaining, there's no reason to say that she's... You know, something, she is a pain in the neck. <laughs> now, listen, Albright, she doesn't get to New York too often. When she does, she likes to be taken around and shown the sights. Well, I'll be glad to show her the Hudson River from the bottom. <laughs> Although she probably would like to look at the waterfront. Okay, I'll take her for a long walk on a short tier. <laughs> All right. Mrs. Purvis is an important client. She inherited the entire state of Mr. Purvis. Oh, did he leave his wife much? Nearly every night. <laughs> oh, well, he is. She's worth a fortune. And she's invested it with us. <laughs> 
so you have to be nice to her. Oh, but what? I can't even stand to look at her. Well, the last time she was here, I took a sightseeing to that farm up in Westchester. When she stood in the cornfield, the birds took her for a scarecrow. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. She frightened the crows so much, they brought back the corn they had stolen three days before. (laughs) However, Mrs. Purvis does have to be entertained. And say, I know just the person to do it. Margie. Margie? Yeah, Margie would be the ideal person to take care of while she's in town. So get her to do it. Now, immediately. No, I'll try. Mrs. Purvis gets in at noon today. Have Margie pick her up at the wall to and show her around. Okay, Mr. Honeywell. And remember, I don't want any slip-ups. I'm warning you. If Margie doesn't come through, I'm going to have you tarred and feathered, boiled in oil, drawn and quartered, kicked, punched and beaten. And then I'm going to get mad. <laughs> We came as soon as we could. Yeah, what's up? You sounded upset on the phone. Mrs. Odette, yes. Freddie, a terrible thing happened. I woke up this morning and suddenly realized that tomorrow is Dad's birthday. What am I going to do? Go oh, back to sleep again. <laughs> How could I have forgotten such an important date as Dad's birthday? I haven't even prepared for it. You're getting absent-minded, Margie. You know, people tie strings around their fingers to help them remember. Yes, and some people tie a rope around their neck to help them forget. (laughs) Well, that's what I feel like doing. This is Odette, Freddy. I've only got one day to get ready. Now, you've got to help me plan a surprise party for Dad and buy him a present and invite people and prepare refreshments and all the other hundreds of things that have to be done. Don't worry, Margie. We'll pitch in. Thank you. I feel better already. Oh, boy, a surprise party. We'll play games and everything. Oh, yeah. Listen, I-, I don't want to play spin the bottle. Why not? I keep falling off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and Freddie, while we're dining, don't jab your fork all over the table. Suppose I want something. Well, if you see something out of reach, you have a tongue. Yeah, but there's no prongs on it. <laughs> the party will be a surprise to your father. Well, I'm pretty sure it will be. Dad's just as forgetful about his birthday as I am. I'll bet the date slipped his mind completely. No wonder it slipped his mind. He uses too much grease on his hair. (laughs) You just make jokes like that at the party, Buster, and we'll play pin the tail on the donkey. (laughs) And you know who the donkey was. I'm sure Dad's forgotten about his birthday, but just to play it safe, not a peep about this to him or it'll spoil a surprise. You hear that, Freddy? Don't you peep one little peep or I'll pop you. (laughs) Well, come on, let's get downtown. There's so little time. I couldn't possibly spare a second for anything else in the world besides Dad's party. Hello, Margie. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi, Mr. Albright. Hey, Dad, what are you doing home so early in the day? Oh, something important has come up. You remember my client, Mrs. Purvis? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to spend all day today entertaining her. But, but Dad, I can't. I have a previous appointment. What appointment? Uh, I'm taking her to my uncle's fish market. (laughs) Fish market? For what purpose? Oh, he doesn't sell porpoise, just halibut. (laughs) Margie, why are you going to a fish market? He told you, just for the halibut. (laughs) Do you expect me to believe that? I don't understand what's behind all this, but I I don't like your attitude. You're leading me around by the nose. Aren't you glad? That way you won't have to smell the fish. (laughs) Marty, I don't get it. Why are you acting this way? For what purpose? No purpose, just halibut. (laughs) Margie, Margie, I'm warning you. I want you to pick up Mrs. Purvis at the Waldorf at noon and spend the day with her. Well, I'll try. 
maybe. He doesn't know that she can't spare the time. Margie needs every minute to prepare a surprise party for his birthday. We find her now downtown with Freddie and Mrs. Odette. It's long past the time she was due to meet Mrs. Purvis at the hotel. Margie, I'm worried for you. You didn't keep the appointment with your father's client. Well, it couldn't be helped. I had too much shopping to do. Just picking out that birthday cake and candles took two hours. Oh, I love birthday cakes and candles. On my next birthday, I'm going to have 30 candles on my cake. 30! <laughs> What are you going to do? Burn the candles at both ends? <laughs> Bless your little sense of humor. Margie, you better pick out a present for your father. It's getting late. Yeah, but what? Hey, here's a furniture store. I'll bet Dad would like a new easy chair. Hey, that's a good idea. Come on, let's go in. Oh, uh, a clerk? Yes, may I help you? <laughs> Do you carry easy chairs? You no, know, I'm having enough trouble driving myself around. <laughs> well, I meant, do you have them to sell? Oh, yes, indeed. Easy chairs on easy payments. Now, here's a lovely chair. It's a Louis XIV. No, I want a larger one. Let me see a Louis XVI. <laughs> Peasant. <laughs> oh, I have just the thing. Uh, look, this is a convertible chair. At the touch of a button, it lays back and becomes a bed. A convertible chair. See, that's a marvelous idea. I'll bet my father would love something like that. How does it work? Oh, it's very simple. It works on electricity. Oh, that's what I should have given my third husband, Newbold, an electric chair. <laughs> Why didn't you? The state beat me to it. <laughs> well, it's not that kind of a chair. Uh, here's the control panel under the arm. These buttons raise it, lower it, and swivel it around. Boy, I'm going to try that. Let's see. I sit down in it like this, and I press this button. Yeah. Now you're lying in a bed. Don't just stand there. Kiss me. Good night. <laughs> Press the other button, Freddy. Okay. Now bring it up to a sitting position. But be careful. Don't bring it up too fast. It's got a very springy action to it. Ah, don't worry. I like springy things. Here goes. Ow! <laughs> Freddy, come down from that chandelier. <laughs> oh, Lady Lothar, he looks so natural. <laughs> Hey, now, then, about this chair, Miss, uh, Miss, uh... All right. Yes, I think my father would be delighted with a chair like this. Uh, here's my card. Would you deliver it tomorrow evening? I'd be glad to. Thank you. Come on, Mrs. Odette, let's go. Oh, uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, what do you want me to do about the boyfriend hanging up there? <laughs> oh, just throw him a banana every two hours and you'll be quiet. <laughs> Mrs. Purvis, please let me explain. There's no need to. I understand perfectly the idea of keeping me waiting. It's a shame. What a beautiful day. And I waited and waited, but nobody showed up. I'm mad. Oh, please, Mrs. Purvis, let me tell you what happened. Don't bother. It'll do no good. I'm canceling my accounts. You're all so hateful. You promised I'd be entertained. I don't get here often, you know. There's so many things I want to see. Broadway shows, bargain basements. You go to bargain basements, I do. Don't you dare criticize. I never suspected you'd treat me this way. I expected somebody'd be there. I do it granted. Some things go without saying. Yeah, but not you. <laughs> All right, you are a lunkhead. A stupid, moronic, subnormal lunkhead. Now clean out your desk and... and... Hello. Mr. Honeywell, this is Margie. What do you want? I'd like to invite you to Dad's birthday party tomorrow. What? It's a surprise. I've been working on it all day getting ready. I'm still not through. And you should see the wonderful gift I picked out for him. I see. And please don't tell Dad. It'll spoil the surprise. And I do want him to have a good time. I understand. You'll be here, won't you? The party wouldn't be complete without you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. Uh, thank you for calling. And goodbye. <laughs> all right. Do you know who that was? No. 
Who? Your daughter, Margie. Margie? Yeah. Well, what did she want? Well, she asked me not to tell you, but in view of the circumstances, I will. She's giving you a surprise party tomorrow on your birthday. A surprise party? Yes. Oh, say, that's right. Tomorrow is my birthday. I forgot all about it. Oh, isn't that wonderful? A daughter giving her father a birthday party. Oh, it's so, so heartwarming. Yes, that's what I thought. All right, I'm, I'm so ashamed. Oh, me too. I'm sorry I bowled you out. <laughs> I was concerned about it, a trivial thing like a client. And here she was doing to do a wonderful thing, showing her great capacity for my love. Father love. Uh, I don't have any children, but I can appreciate <laughs> Because I haven't had a good birthday 
party in years. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> but but why should Margie cancel my party? She she loves me. Yes. She worships the very ground you should be buried under. <laughs> oh, I'm so mad at you. I just had to come up here and tell you. Goodbye. <laughs> to have that party. Now, you think if I went home and started buttering her up that she'd change her mind? You mean reverse yourself and be kind and gentle to her? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might work. Okay, I'll go home and do it. And then she'll throw the party. Of course, if it doesn't work, you'll be the party she'll throw right out the window. That was terrible of your father to say things like that to you. No wonder you called off the party. Freddie, I've never seen him that cruel in my life. He's gotten so mean, I'll bet if I cut my finger, he'd cry over it just so he could get salt in the wound. (laughs) Yes, sir, that man has certainly changed. Hi, Margie. Oh, how's the sweetest, dearest, most wonderful little daughter a man ever had? Whoops, he's changed again. (laughs) I beg your pardon. Can I get you something, baby? A sandwich, a glass of milk, an apple? He's flipped. (laughs) Can I get you something? A glass of water? A straight jacket? (laughs) Margie, I'm sorry I lost my temper. Why, why, you mean so much to me. You're my treasure, my jewel, the only thing I have to live for. Am I... Really, Dad? Oh, of course you are. And you know what I am? I'm just an old fool. No, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. You're not so old. (laughs) Oh, Margie, that that silly client of mine wasn't important, but you are. You're a fine daughter. One in a million, and I'm proud of you. You mean everything to me. (laughs) You mean everything to me, too, Dad. The orchestra will now play Hearts and Flowers, accompanied by Mademoiselle Freddie on the glockenspiel. Quiet, Freddie. Dad, your new attitude made me reconsider something. I guess you're a pretty nice guy after all, and... Well, I've changed my mind about something. You have? Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, uh... uh, What is it? Oh, never mind. But you'll like it. Ah, whatever it is, I'm glad. (laughs) You know, we have to make the most of the time we have left together. I may not be around too much longer. What do you mean, Dad? Well, I'm getting on in years. I'm beginning to feel my age. You know, the the old ticker, it isn't what it should be. It it may not be too long, Margie. Oh, Dad! Yep, one never knows. A shock, a disappointment. Dad, I've changed my mind again. Uh, what do you mean? I might as well tell you, I was going to give you a birthday party tomorrow, but I'm calling it off again. Oh, why? Oh, in your condition, the excitement might kill you. <laughs> oh, no! you decided to give me that party after all. Me too, Dad. Gosh, everybody's arriving. The crowd from the office, my sorority, and look, here come some of your friends from the club. Oh, boy, I can hardly wait to get started. Uh, Mark, the man from the furniture store just brought that chair in for your father. Chair? My present to you, Dad. Look, there it is. Wow, it's a, oh, it's a beaut. Oh, thanks, Marge. I'm going to try it out. Uh, but, Dad, oh, wait a later. No, I want to do it before the party begins. Now, quiet, everybody. 
I, I'm going to test this chair. Now, let's see. I, I sit at it like this, and then I push this button to lower it. Uh, ca careful, Dad. It's tricky. Uh, nonsense. Here goes. a wonderful Sunday lunch today. How in the world did you make such delicious chicken salad? Oh, I made it with a can of tuna. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I want to do now is listen to the World Series game. Oh, Rudy, why do you want to listen to an old ball game? Well, if I don't listen, how will I know what the score is? Well, Rudy, did you ever know? <laughs> There you are, folks, the Neb, straight from America's famous comic strip, with Junior, Obie Slider, and all the others you've laughed, worried, and adventured with for 22 years. On this peaceful Sunday afternoon, we find the Nebs at home, and Rudy is listening to the World Series. Here they are. Rudy, what are they yelling and swooning for? Why, they got three men on base and Greenberg's at bat. Now, shh. Oh, I thought they'd discovered Frank Sinatra in the crowd. Yeah, uh, just be quiet, Fanny, and listen. Now the bases are loaded with two men out. Big Hank Greenberg is waiting for the next pitch. The count is three balls and two strikes, and here it comes. Greenberg connects with it, and the ball plays. Oh, Fanny! Fanny! Oh, what's happened? Why, the radio's quit. Oh, what am I going to do? Maybe if I shake it... Oh, Rudy, what are you doing? Trying to make it into kindling? Yeah, quick, Fanny, get in my tool chest there while I locate the trouble. All right. I'll have to take some of these parts out. Uh, let me see now. I'll, I'll put the tubes over here. And this gadget here. And these little screws, I've got to keep them separate. I'll, I'll just hold them in my mouth. Here are the tools, Rudy. Oh, thanks. I'll have it fixed in no time. Oh, you won't if you keep swallowing those nuts and bolts. Well, now, Fanny, I've got to put them somewhere. There's no more room on the floor. No, I guess there is room on the floor at that. Well, now, you just get busy and pick all those up. No. You know, our friends always drop in on Sunday afternoon. Yes. Anyway, I don't think you should be working at a radio on Sunday. Well, maybe I'll be forgiven if I get it fixed in time to listen to tonight's sermon. Now, let me see. Uh, where does this piece go? It doesn't go there. That's a piece of Junior's roller skate. Uh. <laughs> well, it fits better on the radio. Oh, shucks, what an awful time for the radio to go haywire, right at the most exciting part of the game, when the score was one to one in the third. Now, I'll never know what happened. You'll hear about it from Obie or Herb or Ambie Potts or somebody. Ambie Potts. Ambie doesn't know a baseball from a grape. I like to get my baseball firsthand. Fanny, you wait till the new radios come out. I'll buy the best double reversible combination radio made. Absolutely non-static with FM every AM and PM. Oh, <laughs> You'll probably have to wait. My new washing machine and the electric mixer come first. Why the idea, Fanny? You can't hear radio programs on an electric mixer. <laughs> and whoever heard of getting the Cubs and the Tigers together in a washing machine? <laughs> now, who do you suppose is calling who we might or might not be home to? Oh, Rudy, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Come in. Good afternoon, Mrs. Neb. Hello, Mr. Neb. Oh, hello, Buck. Howdy, Buck. Jeepers, Mr. Neb, what are you making? An atomic bomb? An atomic bomb. No, I'm not. Oh. Is Junior home? No, he isn't, Buck. He went over to see Donna for a while. Hey, what's the matter with Junior lately, Mrs. Neb? 
All he thinks about is girls. Well, Buck, there comes a time in the life of every man when, as the poet says, uh, uh, what was it the poet said, Fanny? No, I'm sure I don't know. But when that time comes and a boy starts thinking about girls, it's like the taxes that's here to stay. Keepers, <laughs> <laughs> you mean they never snap out of it? Rarely, Buck, rarely. And if they do, they usually snap back in again. Uh, <laughs> gee whiz, I'd rather play baseball. Ah, uh, now you're talking, Buck. Oh, say, uh, how's the World Series going? I don't know. I came over here to listen because Mom won't let me tune in the ball game. She thinks it's too brutal the way they keep knocking out the pitchers. <laughs> I see. And Junior went over to Donna's to listen to hers. Well, what's the matter with your radio? What's the matter with it? Don't you see these parts all over the floor? Golly, did it explode? No, oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Nib scattered it without any help. Um, uh, there was a loose connection, Buck, and one thing led to another until the whole thing got loose. Well, seems that there was uh, just a general giving away of all the tissue. Ah, uh, but don't worry, son. I'll have that game coming in again before Charlie Grimm can chase another umpire. Stand back, Fanny. Maybe I ought to mention that I've built two radios myself, including condensers, antennae, loudspeakers. Well, you don't say. Sure. I get standard, short wave, medium wave. Everything but a permanent, eh, Buck? <laughs> well, I almost got a permanent once, too. By mistake, I grabbed hold of a high-tension wire. Well, <laughs> my boy, it's fine if you're born a live wire, but don't ever try to pick it up. No, sir. But I'll be glad to help you fix your radio, Mr. Nett. Oh, no, no, no. I can fix it. Are you sure, Rudy? Why, of course, my love. It's quite simple. This tube here, it goes into, uh, uh, no, it, it goes into, uh... uh... doesn't it go into there, Mr. Uh, Nett? Yes, that's just what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> then, now, this part fits into, uh, let me see, it, uh... It fits right into here, Mr. Nett. <laughs> yes, that's what I thought. Now, <clears throat> now, hand me those pliers, Buck. Sure, here. Ah, uh, thanks. Now, I'll just snip this wire off a little here. Oh, hey, Mr. Neb, you shouldn't have done that. Huh? What? You cut the cord that plugs into the wall socket. Oh. It probably got in his way, Buck. Let me show you how that goes, Mr. Neb. You better let me have the pliers. Okay, my boy. I'll take over again when you get tired. You're a very talented boy, Buck. Uh, you play the piano, too, don't you? A little. Say, I didn't know that. You play by ear or by note, Buck? By note, Mr. Neb. Uh-huh. Now, how many notes are there on your piano? Fifteen on ours. We pay one every month. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a wife or a mother, take a good look at your men folk. Do you notice signs of nervousness, circles under the eyes, worry and overwork? Do they complain of sleep being interrupted, nervousness or rheumatic pains? These symptoms may be caused by excess acid when there's nothing organically or systemically wrong. The medicine calls Systex. See why STEX usually goes to work right now. Helping nature clear away excess acids and poisons. You must discover Systex to be a quick and easy way to help remove excess acids through the blood, or your money back is guaranteed on return of the empty package. Get Systex, C Y S T E X, and take it as directed with a glass of water after each meal. See how much better you feel tomorrow. <laughs> And now, back to the Nebs. Oh, Buck, uh, how are we doing with the radio? Well, right now i got to check your terminals. And you had the tuning condenser where the dynamic speaker ought to be. Is that so? Well, I guess I'm getting nearsighted. We'll have that ball game tuned in in a few minutes, Mr. Neb. Buck, that was a darling hat your mother was wearing last week. Do you happen to know where she got it? No, Mrs. Neb. But Dad said wherever she got it, she should give it back to them. <laughs> now, Fanny, don't interrupt. I'll have to change the tubes around a bit differently from the way you had them, Mr. Nib. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised, Buck, if you became a great inventor, like Mr. Edison. Fanny, will you please be quiet? Well, Mr. Edison was pretty good, all right. Hold this, will you, Mr. Nib? Didn't Edison invent the first talking machine? No, Fanny, not the first one, but he did invent one that could be shut off. <laughs> Fanny, answer the phone, will you? And find out what the score is. Hello? Yes, dear. Oh, just a moment. It's Junior Buck. He wants to talk to you. Ah, oh, gee, thanks. Excuse me a minute. Uh, tell him to make it snappy, Buck. Hello? Junior? Hey, Buck, how'd you like to come over to Donna's house for a while? Well, jeepers, Junior. You've got Donna. What do you need me for? <laughs> well, I don't exactly need you, but Donna's got a girlfriend. Ah, oh, but, Junior, I wanted to listen to the ball game. Well... I just found out there's something more fun than baseball. <laughs> uh-uh. It couldn't be. Besides, right now, I'm fixing your dad's radio. Tell him to hang up, Buck. 
Your father says to hang up, Junior. Oh, come on over, Buck. Donna's serving ice cream. Okay, you talk me into it. Goodbye, Junior. Come on, Buck. We're losing time. That series game won't wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Neb, but I gotta go over to Donna's house and do Junior a favor. Why, you can't go off and leave my radio in this condition. We'll have it working in just a few minutes. But, Mr. Neb, you said you'd take over when I got tired. And I think I'm tired right now. <laughs> You're tired. Yeah, I think I need some refreshments. I'll see you later, Mr. Neb. Goodbye. Well, how do you like that? Here I sit in the middle of the floor, in the middle of a country that has the finest communications in the world. We got telephones, television, teletype, and I can't tell what's happening between the tigers and the cubs. <laughs> oh, well, stop fuming and get busy, or you'll never get that radio fixed. Yeah, they call this a free country, with free speech. Everybody's supposed to know what's going on. I pay my taxes, don't I? But do I know the score? It seems like we mentioned that before. I'm talking about the ball game, Fanny, and I'm thinking about... Oh. Come in! Fanny, why do you always tell everybody to come in when you don't know who's at the door? If it wasn't Sunday, I might be working here in my undershirt. <laughs> well, come in, Obi. Rudy, it's Obi Slider. Oh. Hello, Fanny. What's our eyes doing? Come in and sit down, short change. Do you know anything about a radio? Well, I know enough about one to let it alone. What's the trouble? Uh, Rudy found a loose connection. Well, I knew he had one. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought he'd find it. No wonder those correspondence courses Rudy took years ago didn't do him any good. Uh, Fanny, don't pay any attention to that waddling old gander. Correspondence courses? Oh, B, has Rudy been holding out something on me? No. No, but he thought the correspondence schools were holding out on him. No. Oh, I'll never forget the letter he wrote when he graduated. Obi, Obi, will you please be quiet? He wrote, Dear Sir, I've taken all your courses. Now, where's the brains you promised me? <laughs> well, you antiquated angleworm, if you're so brainy, why don't you get down here and help me before the ball game's over? It's probably about the last half of the seventh inning by now. The last half of the seventh? Yeah. Well, time to stretch. <sighs> I don't know why I'm always so tired on Sunday, unless it's from wading through them big Sunday papers. You're tired. How about me? This afternoon, I've lost ten pounds, three screwdrivers, and most of my interest in the ball game. Uh, where's Junior? Was he smart enough to go someplace else to listen to the game? Junior heard the call of the wild. He went over to Donna's. Oh. Well, look, nothing, Ball. Uh, if you're so anxious to hear the World Series, why don't we go over to my house? Huh? We can hear the finish from there. Why, well, Obi, why, well, why didn't you think of that before? Yeah, uh, Fanny, would you like to come along? No, thank you, Rudy. I'd rather take a nap. Well, let's go, Rudy. There's nobody at my house but my good wife, Hepsy. <laughs> In anybody's house, Obi, your good wife, Hepsy, would be quite enough. Well, we can listen to the game nice and quiet here, Rudy. Oh, sounds like Hepsi's already got the radio warmed up. Ah, sounds like he might be on fire. Well, I guess Hepsi's out in the kitchen. Must be why it's turned on so loud. Uh, just sit down, Rudy. I'll switch the ball game. We have a wonderful recipe sent in by Mrs. Fred Howard of Baltimore, Maryland, for Veronica Lake pea soup. <laughs> in case you're wondering why we call it Veronica Lake pea soup, it's because we use one-eyed peas. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, Obi, hurry up and get the game. Well, I thought at first that I had it, and the umpire was in the soup. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, that was one of the most terrific drives ever smacked off a bat in this man's ballpark. With the bases loaded... Oh, the dial! Oh, hello, Hepsi. What's the big idea? Well, uh, were you speaking to me? I was not. I was yelling at you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Hepsi. Oh, howdy, Rudy. Obadiah, what did you turn the opera off for? Well, uh, Rudy and I wanted to listen to the World Series baseball game. Did you get it? Yep, we got it when you... Well, uh... what did you have when you got it? Well, honey bun, we had the bases loaded and... What were they loaded with? We never found out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if they were the Cubs or the Tigers. Cubs or Tigers? And say, Obadiah, when did they start broadcasting circuses? Pepsi, Pepsi, you don't understand. Greenberg picked on a cripple, he knocked it out of the park, and he drove three tigers home ahead of him. What is he, an animal trainer? <laughs> oh, Pepsi, that isn't the idea. We're talking about a ball game that's being played right this minute in Chicago. Then why don't they play ball and leave those poor animals alone? Oh, let's go, Rudy, before she writes to the Humane Society. Oh, no. You two could just sit there and listen to something good. I'll get that up again. I'm going back to the kitchen. I'm baking a pie. Well, take your time, Hepsi, I hope. I'll be back to visit me, Rudy. 
Uh, don't hurry, Hepsy. Hey, look, Rudy, can you sing? Well, sometimes I do a little harmonizing in Herb's Barbershop. Well, then I'll switch the radio back to the ball game and get the score while you sing like this here opera, heaven forbid. Well, I, I guess that's better than missing the game entirely. <coughs> me, 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 <coughs> me. Well, it looks like there's an argument down there on the field. Yes, the infield has come into the plate to talk it over with the umpire, so we'll take the time to recapitulate the score inning by inning. Start singing, Rudy. Really? Yes. Unhold that tiger. Unhold that tiger. Unhold that tiger. Oh, Medaya. Unhold that tiger. Oh, Medaya. What intonation are you doing with that radio? Uh, static, Pepsi. Yes, Awful lot of like static. A, looks like a thunderstorm's coming up. And not far off, either. Obadiah, get away from that radio. Now, Hepsy, all we want to do is find out the score. Rudy went and broke his radio. Well, if you two don't get out of here, I'm going to break this one. Now, Hepsy, before you do anything rash, I want you to get one thing straight. And what's that, Obadiah? Rudy and I... We're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Are you one of the thousands of people who don't drink enough water? If so, here's a health tip. Drink a glass of cool, pure water after every meal. At the same time, take two tasteless, sugar-coated little tablets of Systex. The Systex you see goes right along with the water and helps nature clear away excess acids, which, if too concentrated and allowed to accumulate, may cause rheumatic pains, loss of energy, make you nervous, and what is of prime importance may interrupt your sleep. So if you feel tired, run down, and old before your time... Why don't you try taking Systex? C-Y-S-T-E-X with a full glass of water after each meal. When there's no organic or systemic cause, Systex usually goes to work right now, helping nature eliminate excess acids and poisons through the bloodstream. And this aid to nature in filtering and cleansing the blood may bring more restful sleep, a quick increase in vitality, help to make rheumatic pain subside, actually make you look and feel years younger. This much is certain. Systex must satisfy you in every way, do far more for you than you expect, or you simply return the empty package and your money back is guaranteed. So get money back, guaranteed Systex. C-Y-S-T-E-X from your druggist today. Take it with a glass of water after each meal. See how quickly it puts you on the road to feeling like new again. Now back to our story with Gene Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart as Rudy and Fanny Neb. Well, Rudy, you and Obie came back in a hurry. Is the ball game over? How in the world would I know? Hello, Fanny. Uh, looks like I'm going to have to help Rudy fix his radio. My goodness, what happened? Well, Hepsy wanted to listen to the opera. And just when Greenberg was about to hit a homer. Well, I don't blame her. Opera is much better than listening to somebody hitting poor Homer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're all alike. Come on, Obi. If we work fast, there's still time to reassemble this radio and pick up the last part of the game. Well, right now, I must say, the game is sure spread all over the floor. <laughs> oh, there goes that bell again. Maybe it's somebody who knows the score. Coming. Well, it's her. Uh, howdy, folks. Howdy. How come you're not at the barbershop, Herbie? Can't see why I should be at the barbershop. Can't see why. It's Sunday. Or what day is it? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's right. I forgot. Herb, what's the score? Score? Uh, what score? Oh, the score, yes. Uh, what's that? The score of the baseball game. Oh, the baseball game. Never listened to baseball games. Always got my ear to the ground, though. Uh, sounds like you got it in the mud. <laughs> Herb, don't you know the Chicago Cubs and the Detroit Tigers are deciding who's to be the world's champion? Can't say as I do. No, can't say. Thought Joe Lewis was world's champion. <laughs> <laughs> Herb, I think you keep up with sports just about like I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Up with one last night. <laughs> sure you are. <know. laughs> Glad to go to bed, though. Oh, you don't have to. You're asleep right now. We're trying to fix the radio so we can find out how the game's going. Oh, yeah. Wish it said so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wish you had. Might have had it all fixed while you were, um, yeah. Uh, no, don't think it would. No, sure. <laughs> do, do you know how to fix a radio? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, so, just so. Well, let me see, Rudy. How's that dude you got working? You got right by now. It doesn't. That gadget Obie's putting put on there is too tight for the thingamabob. Besides, Herb, that she bang under the doodiddle squeak. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, better twist around, twist around. 
Yeah, how's that? Yeah, fine, just fine. Don't think it did any good. Hey, <laughs> we'll have this radio working in no time. What'll I do now, Herbie? Oh, well, let me see now. Let me see. Had it right on the tip of tongue. Right on the tip of it. It fell off, though. No. <laughs> That's a screwdriver you got in your mouth. Though. Oh, yes, yes. Just what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there. Hold the screwdriver. Yeah, got it. Uh, Rudy, you uh, get the chisel and hammer. That's your thing, Herb. Yeah, just so. Now you knock off that little dual little lid. No good anyway. This gadget here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, here goes. Say, hey, we got the darn thing together. Ah, uh, now we'll find out what the score is. Ladies and gentlemen, what to play? It works. By golly, it works. Out into deep left. And well, maybe if I again. turn this thing half. No, no, let it alone. It's working fine. Hey! Well, well, Chibasta, what's that sticking out of your mouth, Rudy? Two more loud speak out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Neb, what did you do to her? Did you give him a hot foot? No, Junior, I didn't, but I'd like to after what he did to our radio. But have you, by any chance, heard anything about the ball game? Who's pitching now? Well, Donna and I have been pitching a little woo, if that's what you... No, no, the ball game. How's it going? I don't know, Dad. How is it going? Go on, Rudy, tell him. How's it going? If I knew, I wouldn't be asking. You can look at my radio and tell I don't know anything. Never a truer word spoken. <laughs> oh, Mr. Neb, that's awful. Oh, Buck, come and look at Mr. Neb's radio. Jeepers, Mr. Neb, haven't you made any progress with that radio at oh, all? Oh, Buck, come on and help us put this thing together. If ever there was a time you were needed, it's now. And that's what Buck's afraid of, Pop. Mm, yes, Mr. Neb. Why, we left my ice cream party because Buck's conscience was hurting him for leaving you alone with the radio. Oh, it wasn't my conscience. It was my stomach. <laughs> Buck, Buck, I I'll make you a proposition. You fix this radio so I can hear whatever's left of the game and name your price. Money's no object. Will you make it enough so it will be an object? I'll give you a dollar. Cheapskate. Obi, you be quiet. Oh, but Rudy, give Buck a chance to figure whether he wants to contract for the whole job or do it piecework. Well, it'll cost you more than a dollar if I charge by the piece. Well, I'm in a hurry. I'll give you three dollars. Three and a half. Four dollars. We'll make it five. Five it is. I'll be very happy to fix it for five dollars, Mr. Neb. All right. Hey... How did the price get up so fast? I was bidding against you, owl eye. <laughs> Obi, how I ever picked you for a business partner, I'll never know. Well, don't pat yourself on the back for that. It was my idea. Now, but get busy. Obi and I'll help. We'll all help. Oh, you don't have to, Mr. Nib. Five dollars is all the help I'll need. But, Pop, Buck and I want to play catch, don't we, Buck? Well, Junior, you see... Well, Junior, please don't talk to Buck. Never bother a man when he's busy. Uh, uh, get busy, Buck. I'm busy, Mr. Uh, Nib. Gee, Pop, Buck and I have to play catch today on account of tomorrow is school, and I can't take my new glove to school on account of Mickey Dooley won't let me play with him. He won't let you play with your own baseball glove? No. He takes it away from me, or else there's a fight. Junior Ned, you stand up for your rights. Oh, he does, Donna, until Mickey knocks him down. <laughs> Junior, what's Mickey got that you haven't got? A left hook. Oh. Why, Junior, when I was your age, I could lick any fellow twice my size. Yes, sir. In my neighborhood, I was kingpin. Mm, from kingpin to pinhead in one easy lesson. <laughs> well, come on, Rudy. Let's get out of here and let Buck and Junior fix the radio. To think that right now Hank Greenberg may be blasting that old horse hide all over Chicago. Rudy, why all this sudden interest in baseball? What do you mean, sudden interest? Baseball's the great American pastime, isn't it? Why, I was weaned on baseball. I cut my teeth on horsehide. Are you sure it was horsehide? What do you mean, was it horsehide? Oh, nothing. Only you bray so much. <laughs> uh, how's that radio coming, Buck? Okay. Rudy, I'll bet you couldn't hit a baseball with a canoe paddle if the ball was the canoe and you were sitting in it. Is that so? <laughs> yes, that's so. Uh, Junior, give me your glove and ball. All right, Pop. Catch. Uh-oh. See, Rudy, what to tell you? Well, I didn't have my glasses on. Come on, Obi. While Buck's fixing the radio, you step outside with me, and I'll show you some big league stuff. Okay, Greenberg. Oh, Pop, can't I come out and play, too? Now, Junior, you either help Buck entertain Donna or study your homework for school tomorrow. That's right, Junior. Rudy wants you to be smart so he'll make a good impression on that pretty teacher you've got. You mean Miss Whitaker? That's the one. Ow! Obi. Obi, hush up. Oh, that Miss Whitaker is the only woman I've ever seen who can make a pair of false eyelashes look honest. Obi, <laughs> let's go outside and play ball. Coming, Father. But that Miss Whitaker. Oh, jeepers, I'm glad they've gone. Now maybe we can get this radio fixed. I don't 
think Mr. Slider makes a very interesting wolf. Do you? No, his howl has a crack in it. <laughs> you shouldn't say that, Junior. Unless you're jealous, of course. Me? Jealous? Now, Donna, don't get the wrong impression. Anyway, Miss Whittaker is practically an old maid. Why, she must be 22. Why, some girls can be very attractive at 22. With the right makeup and false eyelashes like Miss Whittaker's. Well, gosh, maybe she can't help it. Maybe she's got bald eyelids. <laughs> Listen, kids, how about helping me concentrate on fixing this radio? Sure. Anyway, Donna, I'm practically not at all interested in Miss Whittaker simply because she happens to be my teacher and my book. Junior Neb, how long do you intend to remain in the 10th grade? I think that depends on how long Miss Whittaker intends teaching it. <laughs> Buck, you just be good enough to concentrate on that radio. You're getting five dollars for fixing it. So everybody's happy. I'll have five dollars and you'll have a date with Donna. Not if he stays in the tenth grade. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. Rudy, why don't you get Junior out here to pitch to you? Junior's pitching inside. Come on, Obie. We haven't done anything since we came out here but sit in the shade. Well, I'm the reminiscing type. Got nothing left but memories. I'm getting too old to remember them. <laughs> Come on out here. Okay. Ah, oh, boy. Feels good to put on a baseball glove again, eh? Hubba, hubba, hubba. You ought to wear a baseball glove all the time, Rudy. You got nothing but thumbs. Ah. Now, listen, half pint. You just wind up and shoot the ball to me. Okay. Here she comes. <clears throat> that, that one slipped through. Hey, why don't you throw the glove away and get a bucket? Come on and play ball. <laughs> Come on. Throw me another one. You asked for it. Here's a curve, high and on the outside. Ow! You threw a bean ball. Make a note to get a suit of armor. Where, where did that ball go? Uh, you can't find it while you're counting stars. All right, Obi Slider. I'd just like to see you do that again. It'll be a pleasure. Oh, Miss Neb. Oh, Miss Neb. Hey, Pop, can I catch a few now? Stand back, Junior. I haven't got the kinks out yet. Hey, Mr. Neb, you wanted to get the... Now, kid, you've got all week to play ball. It looks like Obi and I could take over for just one afternoon. Well, I've had enough, Rudy. Let them play. Let them play, he says. Why, Obi, you remember the fellows who perfected that famous triple play, Tinker to Evers to Chance? I don't know anything about Stinky or if he ever took a chance. Well, Mr. Neb, Mr. Neb, you said you wanted to... Well, listen. they never would have been famous if they hadn't practiced, would they? Play ball. But, Pop... Quiet, Junior. You just sit down there and warm the bait. Mr. Nim, you've got to listen. What's the matter, Buck? Can't you fix that darn radio? Well, that's what Buck's been trying to tell you, Mr. Huh? Nim. The radio's fixed, and you can get the World Series. Well, why didn't you say so? Move over, Nim. You're blocking the traffic. I've waited all day for this moment. Here, here now. I'll turn it on. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up our World Series broadcast for today. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll be back in just a moment. Faith and hope are two important characteristics necessary to health, happiness, and success. Without hope, we lack the courage to try. Without faith, we give up too soon. So if you feel tired, nervous, run down, worn out, older than your years, if you suffer from rheumatic pains or if your sleep is frequently disturbed without organic or systemic cause, I firmly believe that you have a great deal to gain by pinning your faith and hope on Systex. C-Y-S-T-E-X. You see... Systex is a doctor's formula designed to aid nature in clearing away excess acids and accumulated body poisons, which may be the unsuspected cause of a wide variety of pains, aches, physical discomfort, and lack of energy. Thousands of men and women in the United States and throughout the world who were tired and discouraged are now finding new joy in living simply because they had hope and tried Systex. This much is certain. Systex must help you quickly and surely must prove worth far more than the small cost, or you simply return the empty package and your money back is guaranteed. So get money back, guaranteed Systex, from your druggist today. Take it exa exactly as directed with a glass of water after each meal. See how quickly it puts you on the road to feeling like new again. <laughs> Here are the nets. 
Rudy, are you still fooling with that radio? I thought Buck fixed it. He did, Fanny, and it cost me five dollars. Oh, well, stop brooding over it. Well, it isn't the five dollars. It's just that I've lost confidence in this radio. What a strange thing to say. Oh, I always thought a man's radio was like his dog, a companion to him, always right there, the snap of a switch wagging its air. You know? I see what you mean, Rudy, but please stop brooding. When a man hasn't a friend in the world, when nobody ever speaks to him, his radio will talk. Talk, even sing to him. Oh, you're wasting an awful lot of sentiment on that radio. Not anymore, Fanny. I'm disillusioned. This thing let me down today at an important time, like the World Series. All right, Rudy. You can have your new radio, and I'll wait for my washing machine. Why, uh, thanks, Fanny. Well, after all, a washing machine is nothing but a tub and a washboard with a motor on it. But, Rudy, I'm tired of being the motor. <laughs> Join us next Sunday, same time, when Sistax again presents Gene Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart as the next. If you'd like to attend one of these broadcasts and meet Gene and Kathleen Lockhart in person, like to radio station KHK Los Angeles 38 for tickets. And ever created by Saul Hess and are supervised for radio by the Bears. This is Tom Dixon saying goodbye for Sistax. Read the nebs every day in the Los Angeles Examiner. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Sistax presents The Neb, starring Gene Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart as Rudy and Fanny Neb. The Neb, straight from America's famous comic strip, with Junior, Obie Slider, and all the others you've laughed and adventured with for 22 years. Well, it's a crisp October Saturday morning, and the Neb household is bustling with activity. Fanny Neb is going briskly about her housework, while husband Rudy bubbles with sparkling vim, vigor, and vitality. Oh, Rudy, you sound like a tired breeze blowing through a bass horn. Uh, Would you mind going someplace else while I clean this room? Oh, Fanny, I'm just relaxing a little until it's time to go to the office. There isn't anything you'd like me to do before I leave, is there? Well... Uh, no, I didn't think so. Yes. You might empty the ashtrays, burn the rubbish, and scrub the kitchen floor. Why, of course, my dear. I'll have Junior take care of it this afternoon. Oh, thank you, dear. But I'll have it done by that time, in spite of the fact that I must wash the dishes and do the laundry and make the beds and clean the house. Mm. Well... Mm, a woman's work is never done. The trouble with you housewives is, my dear, you don't organize your work. Now, we men... Oh, you men. <laughs> Half your work is just talk. Huh? You dictate letters, hold conferences. Uh, come in. Ha-ha, <laughs> I beat you to it that time. <laughs> oh, why, Toby Slider. Good morning, Fanny. Hello there, lame brain. Well, good morning, uh, wrinkle puss. What's going on around here this morning? Oh, the usual routine, Obi. Housework and more housework. Yeah, I suppose Rudy's helping as usual with a mouthful of conversation. Well, uh, Fanny's a little tired this morning, Obi, but she always insists on doing all the housework at once, just making a mountain out of a molehill. Well, if it wasn't for Han Fanny, a molehill is just what this joint would look like. Thank you, Obi. I was just telling Rudy, you men have it pretty easy. With the domestic help, helps is scarce now, a woman's work boils down to just plain drudgery. Well, Fanny, maybe you do need a little rest. Now, why don't you take a vacation? Go spend a few days with our daughter, Betsy. Junior can, uh, uh, Junior and I can uh, manage here at home. Oh, no. I remember too well what happened the last time I went to Betsy. Yeah, I'll bet when you got home, you sure had a surprise. Oh, she certainly did. Two new sets of dishes. <laughs> <laughs> then I got another surprise that left them all for me to wash. Oh, well, the next time we'll use paper plates. <laughs> Why, Obi? Rudy didn't even bother to send out the laundry. And when I got home, the house was a mess. There wasn't a single clean sheet or a pillow slip. That's right, Fanny. I came over while you were gone, and the only cover on Rudy's bed was two layers of cobwebs. Well, <laughs> after all, I had my own work to do. A man can't run his business, keep house and cook meals at the same time, 
Uh, what's a wife for, anyway? Ooh, to jitterbug with and take out to dinner. Well, I do take my wife out to dinner. Why, every Saturday I say to Fanny... Fanny, let's go to the all come on in and get their warmed-over merchant's lunch. <laughs> well... <laughs> Uh, that that dollar steak dinner isn't so bad if your dentures can take a beating, Rudy. Now, listen, you two, I'm not that bad. Oh, I... Rudy's all right, Obie. He just hasn't any conception of the work involved in running a home. I still think a wife's job is bigger than her husband. But, Fanny, it's all a matter of organization. Organization and executive ability. You ought to run this house just like I run my business. Hey, what do you want to do, Rudy? Break up housekeeping? Why, <laughs> taking care of a house is what I'd call a dream job. Rudy, there's more to it than taking a nap on the sofa. You know, Rudy... Years ago, my wife got me interested in housework. Hmm? How'd you ever do that, Obi? With a rolling pin. <laughs> Why the way you people talk. I'll bet I could do Fanny's work in one half the time it takes her to do it. I'd certainly like to see you try. Why don't you swap jobs with her for a day, Rudy? Oh, be that silly. Fanny couldn't handle my job. Well, I'll bet you couldn't handle hers either. Oh. Furthermore, I'll bet you're afraid to try, you coward. I'm afraid to try? I am not. Oh, now, Rudy. You know you couldn't trade jobs with me. You can't handle my work. Why, of course he can. That'd take somebody intelligent. I can, too, handle it. Bet you can. I can. You can. I can. You won't. I will. When? Right now. Okay, Rudy, that's a bet. <laughs> oh, Obi, that's silly. Don't try to talk him into it. Sister, he's in. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. All right, dear, if you'd like to back out. Yeah, that's right, Rudy. Crawfish. I will not. I never back out of anything. I'll say not. You plunge in head first. <laughs> You bet I'll plunge in, and I'll show you two how things ought to be done around this house. I'll give Fanny a lesson in business administration she'll never forget. You're not kidding, flea brain. Well, Rudy, you're asking for it. He's got it. If you're going to take over his job, Fanny, you want to ride down to the office with me? Thanks, Obi. That's a good idea. Now, Obi, Fanny can't make any business decisions. Why, she's... Don't you worry about me. You take care of the house. Oh, yes, and there's that checkered gingham apron with the frilly sleeves you can put on. Huh? <laughs> oh, boy, would I like to see that. Rudy in a gingham apron with a feather duster for a corsage. Rudy Nip, queen for a day. <laughs> We'll leave our queen for a day for just a moment. In the meantime... Here's a health question for every home. Does anyone in your family feel below par, look run down and haggard? The cause may be excess acids and poisons which should be removed through the bloodstream. These excess acids and poisons may cause circles under your eyes, rheumatic pains in muscles and joints, interrupt your sleep, make you feel nervous, run down and old before your time. When there is nothing organically or systemically wrong, the medicine called Cystex, C-Y-S-T-E-X, usually goes to work right now, helping nature clear away excess acids and poisons through the bloodstream. Stimulating this natural cleansing and purifying action may easily bring you new energy, vitality, and better sleep. You must discover Cystex to be a quick and easy way to help eliminate excess acids through the bloodstream and gain more youthful vitality, or your money back is guaranteed on return of the empty package. So get Cystex, C-Y-S-T-E-X, from your druggist today and take as directed with a glass of water after each meal. See how much better you feel tomorrow. And now, back to the Nebs. Well, Obi, I'll have to admit Rudy's office work is less familiar to me than my housework is to him. I suppose you'd better tell me what his duties are. Fanny, do you want the plain truth, or can I varnish it up a little? <laughs> now, Obi, just what does Rudy do at this time every morning? Well, let me see. We usually run out for a cup of coffee. <laughs> but I don't want any coffee. Well, how about a Coke? No, thanks. Let's get on with the work to be done. Rudy's going to do my housework. I've got to be fair and do his work here. Now, where do we start? Fanny, you don't want to prop your feet up on the desk, do you? <laughs> oh, you men, I don't see how you ever run a business Well, to tell the truth, it runs us, mostly We have our clerks and stenographers and such But all we do is supervise Supervise? Huh? We didn't get here until ten o'clock 
Why, I bet you and Rudy don't even know what time the employees come to work. No, they're always in when we get here. <laughs> I see. <gasps> now look at Rudy's desk. Mm, I've never seen anything as untidy in my whole life. A mountain of circulars. Ads and memorandums all piled in a heap. Well, what does he use for them? To hide behind when he's in conference with a siesta. <laughs> well, I'm going to file them. Well, do you know where to file them? Sure. In the wastebasket. There. Now we can see the desk. Yeah. Nice, rich soil, ain't it? <laughs> now, I think I'll clean all these papers out of the pigeonhole. Well, I'd be careful if I were you, Fanny. The last time Rudy did that, a pigeon flew out. <laughs> I don't know who's taking the worst beating today, me or this rug. The only way to properly vacuum a rug is to move all the furniture out of the room. Well, the ashtrays anyway. Oh. Come in. Oh, good morning, Rudy. Oh, hello, Sylvia. Oh, my goodness. What are you doing with that vacuum cleaner? I'm just rearranging the dust. Oh, and putting, and putting <laughs> broken glass in its place? What a quaint idea. Where's Fanny? Fanny went to my office. But really, what for? Because I do. Oh, but Rudy, why are you cleaning house? Because she does. <laughs> oh, this is the most priceless thing anybody's ever heard of. And I'll bet nobody's heard about it yet. Now, Sylvia, I'll thank you not to go around town telling people I'm doing the housework. I'm only doing this to prove a point. Oh, but Rudy, how are you going to prove anything without witnesses? Well, don't worry. I'll gladly testify. <laughs> oh, dear, I do wish Fanny were here, but I guess you'll have to do. Have you uh, <clears throat> heard the latest? How could I? I haven't seen you for a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me take a deep breath. Uh, uh, now, now, wait a minute, Sylvia. I haven't time to hear about somebody who's in more trouble than I am. I've got beds to make, dishes to wash, and... Really? Imagine Rudy Neb with dishpan hands. <laughs> now, you should talk. You're a tattletale. And you're getting gray. Besides, I have a system for doing dishes. It's funny some clever housewife hasn't thought of it before. Well, what is it, Rudy? Something I could pass along? Any woman would be happy to know of an easy way to keep things clean. Mm, well, you could help them a lot by not talking so much. <laughs> oh, Rudy, go ahead. What is your system of doing the dishes? Why, it's the simplest thing in the world. Haven't you ever heard of a washing machine? A washing machine? Why, of course. Mrs. Twilly tried that once with a beautiful set of china. She profited by it, too. Mm -hmm. What happened? Right away, she was in the chips. <laughs> Sylvia, that is not funny. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, well, you'll have to pardon me now. I've got to get to the dishes. I'll have them done in no time if Junior ever gets home. Well, Rudy, I don't want to keep you from Fanny's work, but uh, I wonder if you've heard about Sophronia Pringle. Hmm? Well, uh, all I know is that she was in financial difficulties a while back. Yes, indeed. Not more than a year ago, the wolf was at her door. Do tell. Uh, what happened? Last week, he moved right into the house with her. Mm. <laughs> they got married. <laughs> His father, you know, was the minister. Mm. Of course, it probably didn't last, though. No? Uh, why not? Well, Sophronia's father's a lawyer, see? <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, that may not happen. I always say, all's well that ends well, unfortunately. Yes, and... Oh, uh, uh, why, here comes Fanny. Oh, hello, Sylvia. Oh, hello, Fanny, darling. I've just been having the grandest chat with Rudy. Well, I don't know whether Sylvia's been chatting with me or at me. Uh, uh, how's things at the office, Fanny? Uh, I didn't think you'd last very long. Uh, I think I've done enough for today. Besides, you always stop work at noon on Saturdays. My goodness, Fanny. You're becoming a regular career woman. Don't you find it difficult to mix marriage with a career? Oh, I don't know. Some people have done it five or six times. Oh, well, I really must be going. Oh, don't hurry, Sylvia. I really must, my dear. Don't forget to have Rudy tell you what I told him. I'll see how it sounds when I hear it from somebody else tomorrow. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, that's Sylvia. Boy, am I glad she's gone. 
If I hadn't been for her, I'd have had all the housework finished by now. Oh, now, Rudy, you seem to be enjoying her visit when I came in. But, Fanny, what she told me. Sylvia said... Never that... mind, you old gossip. Have you done the dishes? Well, not yet. Made uh, the bed? No, but Put the, the laundry into soap? No, I... Then all uh... you've done is break an ashtray. I, uh... Well, yes. Rudy... I usually have all the work done by this time of the day. But, Fanny, you know the routine. I thought you were going to organize things around here. I expected to come home and find some brand new system installed. System? Why, you've got all kinds of systems and conveniences here. Well, you've got vacuum cleaners, electric mixers and unmixers, all kinds of appliances to help you out. Well, don't you have help at the office? Stenographers? Clerks? Clerks and stenographers are different. I'll say they are. They never need new spare parts. Are you one of the thousands of people who don't drink enough water? If so, here's a health tip. Drink a glass of cool, pure water after every meal. At the same time, take two tasteless, sugar-coated little tablets of Cystex. The Cystex, you see, goes right along with the water and helps nature clear away excess acids, which if too concentrated and if allowed to accumulate may cause rheumatic pains, loss of energy, make you nervous, and what is of prime importance may interrupt your sleep. So if you feel tired, run down, and old before your time, why don't you try taking Cystex? C-Y-S-T-E-X with a full glass of water after each meal. When there is no organic or systemic cause, Cystex usually goes to work right now, helping nature eliminate excess acids and poisons through the bloodstream. And this aid to nature in filtering and cleansing the blood may bring more restful sleep, a quick increase in vitality, help to make rheumatic pain subside, actually make you look and feel years younger. This much is certain. Cystex must satisfy you in every way, do far more for you than you expect, or you simply return the empty package and your money back is guaranteed. So get money back guaranteed Cystex. C-Y-S-T-E-X from your druggist today. Take it with a glass of water after each meal. See how quickly it puts you on the road to feeling like new again. And now back to the Neb, starring Gene Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart as Rudy and Fanny Neb. Come on in, Buck. I'll be very happy to, Junior. It's raining outside. Oh, hello, Buck. Good afternoon, Mrs. Neb. Junior, I thought you and Buck were going over to Donna's house. Oh, we left Donna's, Mom. She may be over later. Junior didn't like somebody who was there. Really? Who was there? Oh, just Donna and the whole first-string football team. <laughs> Where's Pop, Mom? Your father's scrambling around in the laundry tubs. What's the matter? Is he sick? No, he decided to do my housework today. Then he is sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Buck. Mr. Neb is merely trying to organize housekeeping around here. Come on, Buck. This I gotta see. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Pop, do you know how funny you look bending over a washboard? Uh, no, Junior, I've got too much soap in my eyes. <laughs> hey, Mr. Neb, it's raining outside. Wouldn't it be a lot easier to pile the laundry out there and pour some soap over it? Buck, <laughs> my boy, nature can do a lot, but it'll never replace elbow grease. But, Pop, why don't you use some executive ability? Uh, Junior, don't mention executive ability to me. Since you seem to have one, is it okay to mention the washing machine? Oh, I put the window curtains in the washing machine, but I forgot to take the rods out. (laughs) Oh. You know, you boys, you boys could be a lot of help to me if you'd care to. But, Pop, it isn't polite for people to work when they've got company. Uh, Who's got company? Me, I've got Buck. And it certainly isn't polite for the company to work when they're visiting somebody. Ah, but the three of us could make a sort of a game out of this, you see. Now, look, we'll pretend that I'm a surgeon performing an operation. (laughs) Don't you wish you were, instead of doing the laundry? Uh, Well, as I was saying, I'm performing the operation, and this pair of pajamas is the patient right here on the operating table, see? You mean the washboard. Uh, uh, Junior, let's keep this professional now. Now, this is an emergency. You're my assistant, and I'm asking you for the instruments, huh? Okay. Now, rubber gloves. Rubber gloves. Soap. Soap. Bleach. Bleach. Hey, the patient's bleeding. That's my knuckles. (laughs) (laughs) 
There, you see? I didn't see you use a scalpel. There wasn't any scalpel. Well, how come there's a hole in the pajamas? <laughs> That's from an old operation. Now, uh, now uh, look, boys. <clears throat> now you take the patient away and bring on another one. Now, Junior, this time you be the surgeon. Oh, Pop. I'll just hold the anesthetic. Well, that's kid stuff. Oh, what do you mean, kid stuff? Why, Junior, this is the kind of work that builds big muscles. Well, then why doesn't Mom have big muscles? Ah, now, women aren't supposed to have them. It wouldn't be ladylike. With men, my boy, it's different. Here, Buck, feel my bicep. Yes, sir. Ah, what does that remind you of? A soft-boiled egg? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, I may have softened up a bit. You should do more scrubbing. Uh, uh, Junior, I've got to get over to Herb's Barbershop this afternoon for a shave and a haircut. Oh, you'll have time to get the rest of the laundry out. It's, it's early yet. Yes, and it's never too early to do things, Junior. Now, I'll give you and Buck each a dollar if you'll finish this and wash the dishes. Oh, Pop. No, 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 just you go right ahead. I'll sneak out the back way so as not to disturb your mother. I think the office was much too much for her today. Uh, see you later. Junior, if we stick around here, we're going to be handpecked too. Well, well, howdy, Rudy, howdy. Oh, hello, Herb. Hello. Yeah, come on in, Rudy Nabby. Oh. Come on in. Nope, ain't no use, though. You already done that. Oh, yeah. Oh, Herb, what a day. Uh, I want to shave and a haircut, Herb. And have you got anything good for ch uh, ch uh, red hands? Yeah, red hands. Yes, red hands. Yup, yup. Got just the thing, Rudy. No good for chapped hands, though. Use it for itchy feet. Uh, your feet itchy, Rudy? I certainly not. But, Herb, just look at my hands. Did you ever see anything so red? Yep, yep, yep. My uncle's nose. Yep. <laughs> yep, finally had to wear dark glasses. Yep, yep. Dark glasses on account of the glare. Done better with a lampshade on his nose, though. <laughs> uh, tell me, what makes your hands so red? I've had them in soapy water. Herb. Let me give you some good advice. Just in case you ever get married, you're going to find the... Oh, yeah, yeah. fine institution. Fine institution, marriage. Wonderful thing for married people. Yep, yep. Man and wife shouldn't be without it. Of course, uh... <laughs> it's no good for me, though. I ain't married. <clears throat> well, in case you ever do get married, Herb, let me tell uh, yes, you... Yes, had a sad experience along that line once. Yeah, might sad. I was two-thirds married. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Beautiful girl, fine head on her shoulders. Nothing in it, though. <laughs> uh, what do you mean, uh, two-thirds married? Uh, well, you see, the girl was there, and the preacher was there. <laughs> I never showed up, though. <laughs> why, Herb, what happened? Oh, alarm clock didn't go off. <laughs> Don't know why it should have, though. Didn't set it. <laughs> Might have, though, if I owned one. Well, there's no use my giving you advice. No, no, no. Don't mind taking advice, would they? Fine thing, advice. Uh, just leave it along with the tip. <laughs> uh, what'd you come in for, Rudy? Well, I told you I wanted a shave and a haircut, and I'll make it snap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shave and a haircut. Oh, yeah, shave and a haircut. <laughs> you know, everybody comes in here wants shave and a haircut. Funny thing, uh, uh, must be because it's a barbershop. Well, now, hurry up, Herb. I've got to get back home and finish my work and stop sticking my neck out. Yeah, stick it out a little more if you want to, Rudy. Yeah. Hair grows pretty low on your neck. Yep. Yeah. You know, I knew a fellow once that stuck his neck out. Almost pulled it back in, though. <laughs> he was a turtle. <laughs> Junior! Junior, where's your father? Oh, he had to go over to Herb's for a shave and a haircut. He wanted to get rid of his five o'clock shadow. Oh, so his genius for organization inspired him to enlist your aid and Buck's. Mm -hmm. Oh, we didn't enlist. We were drafted. <laughs> we didn't want to disturb you, Mom. Pop said you'd had a hard day at the office. Oh, I had a perfectly marvelous time at the office. Now, you boys run along and I'll finish the dishes. Gee, Mom, people like you sure don't grow on trees. Yeah, but from the number of them, you'd think these dishes did. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm doing my own and Mr. Ned's jobs for today. But I'll have to draw the line at getting a haircut and a shave. Come on, Buck, that's Donna. Oh, jeepers, Junior, she'll wait. Oh, hello, Junior. Hi, Donna. Come hello, on Donna. In. Hi, Buck. Gee, Donna, 
What kind of perfume is that? Oh, isn't it heavenly? It's called Bride Secret. What's so secret about a smell like that? <laughs> well, doesn't it thrill you? Well, it's supposed to. Oh, yeah. It gives me goose pimples, but so does Frankenstein. <laughs> Oh, Buck, stop criticizing Donna's perfume. Yeah, but last week she chose chaos, and believe me, there really was. Oh, don't mind, Buck Jr. I assure you I have uh, more important things to worry about. Mm, you mean the football team? Yeah, what happened to the Baby Beef Trust? Oh, uh, they only wanted me to autograph their new football. But jeepers, how could you autograph it with so many guys holding your hands? Oh, now, Junior, don't be so jealous. What's the matter with him, Buck? Junior's enjoying a mild form of insanity, but he isn't old enough to take treatments for it. Uh, what'd you come over for, Donna? Just to show off your new dress? Well, at least you noticed it, Buck. Do you think I look uh, sufficiently pulse-stirring? I can't tell. I've already got high blood pressure. <laughs> Donna, y your dress is simply ravishing. That's what it is. Oh, I can't wait to get a little older and get into a ravishing formal myself. With tails, of course. Oh. Well, I hope you wouldn't care to be seen in a breathless creation of gossamer loveliness, as enchanting as a soft June night, which is exactly what the fashion ad said this was. Ah, they're crazy. This is October. Well, 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 well. Hello, Donna. Oh, hello, Mr. Ned. Ah, you look charming. Uh, uh... Breathtaking creation of gossamer loveliness, as enchanting as a soft June night. Oh, brother. <laughs> I see, Buck. Uh, by the way, I guess I owe you and Junior a dollar each, right? Oh, no, Pop. Mom took over. She's in the kitchen doing the dishes. Oh, she is? Well, well you, you young folks, excuse me. Fanny. Uh, Fanny, dear. Hello, big business executive turned domestic. Now, Fanny, I simply had to get a shave and a haircut. I'll finish the housework myself now and hand back everything to you intact, except an ashtray and that darn washing machine. Oh, don't worry, Rudy. I've made the beds, hung out the laundry, and I've just this minute finished the dishes. Oh, you're a wonderful wife, Fanny. And after today, I'll never say a word about the way you run the house. Uh, I suppose running a business like mine had you a bit confused, too, didn't it? Well, I'll admit there are some of your affairs I can't handle, Rudy. I told you so. Uh, what business in uh, particular, Fanny? Oh, that business you refer to as a good cigar. Fanny, you didn't smoke a cigar. <laughs> Certainly not. Uh, but I did all the rest of your chores at the office. Oh, I shouldn't have let you do that. I might have been called into a conference or got some important phone calls. Oh, by the way, you did have a phone call. Huh? However, I took care of it. Good heavens, I'm probably ruined. Who was it? Timmons, the tailor to better groom men, reminding you that you were going to buy a new suit. Oh, what did you do? I bought one. For myself. Oh, now, Fanny. <laughs> now, Rudy, we traded places for today. I know, but you didn't play fair. Why did you come home so early? Well, I'd rather be home than do what you'd planned to do today. I'd plan something? You probably forgot about it in your desire to show me how to run the house. Why, well, I don't remember. What did I plan to do today? Well, according to your memorandum pad, huh? you'd plan to go fishing, remember? Oh, why don't I attend to my own business? <laughs> We'll return to the NABs in just a minute. Men and women past 35 often are surprised to find they're slowing down, feeling tired out, nervous, and old before their time. Most of these people do not realize that the underlying cause of their troubles may be an accumulation of excess acids and poisons which should be removed through the bloodstream. They do not realize how much younger, stronger, and better they might feel by helping nature correct this condition. When there is nothing organically or systemically wrong, the medicine called Cystex, C-Y-S-T-E-X, usually goes to work right now, helping nature clear away excess acids and poisons through the blood. Stimulating this natural cleansing and purifying action may easily bring you new energy, vitality, and joy in living. So if your sleep is interrupted and you feel nervous, run down, or suffer from rheumatic pains in muscles and joints, why don't you try Cystex? You must discover Cystex to be a quick and easy way to eliminate excess acids through the bloodstream and to gain increased vitality and better and better sleep, or your money back is guaranteed on return of the empty package. So get Cystex, C-Y-S-T-E-X, from your druggist today and take as directed with a glass of water after each meal. See how much better you feel tomorrow. Now, one last minute with the net. Well, Fanny, I've learned a lesson today. A man has no business trying to tell a good wife how to run the house. You're right, Rudy. 
Anytime he decides to do that, he better bait his hook instead of his wife and go fishing. <laughs> and by the same token, a wife shouldn't try to run her husband's office. Or she might soon find he couldn't afford to buy her a new suit. Well, are you ready to be Mr. Neb again huh? and let me be the missus? Ah, uh, Fanny, now I'm going to keep up my end of the bargain. Until this day is done, I'll perform the rest of your duties, my dear. Well, that is what's left of it. Oh, <laughs> Rudy. <laughs> You're sure a glutton for punishment. Well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it's about time for you to start getting dinner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mr. Neb. What? This, this is Saturday, isn't it? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Fanny, get your purse. You're taking Junior and me out to dinner. Oh, <laughs> Join us next Sunday, same time, when Sistax again presents Gene Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart as the Nebs. If you'd like to attend one of our broadcasts and see Gene and Kathleen Lockhart in person, write to radio station KHJ Los Angeles 38 for tickets. The Nebs are written by John Elliott and produced by Wally Ramsey. They were created by Saul Hess and are supervised for radio by the Bears. This is Tom Dixon saying goodbye for Sistax. The Penny Singleton Show. Hello. Happy that you're here. On stage tonight from Hollywood, The Penny Singleton Show. In our story, Penny is Mrs. Penny Williamson, a war widow and the mother of two girls, 13-year-old D.G. and 8-year-old Sue. As Penny says, they are growing and changing so fast that she sometimes feels as if she has a new set of children every 24 hours. She is up in her room tidying up for dinner now as Margaret, her cook, calls upstairs. Dinner's ready, Mrs. Williamson. All right, Margaret, I'll call the girls. They're in their room. Mother, don't take another step. Why, Sue, I didn't know you were in the hall. Is D.G. in her room? Yes, but please, don't step. D.G., dinner. All right, Mother. Oh, Sue, why are you crawling around the floor? Bert Lancaster got loose. Bert La- <laughs> Which or what is Bert Lancaster? My bullfrog. He hopped out here and I can't find him. <laughs> I thought you promised D.G. you wouldn't keep frogs in your room anymore. You know how she feels. She doesn't mind anymore. Since when? Did you say dinner, Mother? Yes, D.G. I'm sorry your sister forgot her promise about frogs. What frogs? Be careful where you walk, D.G. All right. You see, Mother? Yes. I've never seen her like that. I got frogs in the bedroom. She's got bats in the belfry. (laughs) That's no way to... Come on, let's go down to dinner. We've got to find Bert first, please. Oh, all right. Well, I don't see him. He must be hiding. We'll have to give him the lady frog love call. What's that? Gunk. He'll answer if he gets interested. Well, um, how do you tell a lady frog's call from a man frog's? I don't know, but the bullfrogs sure do. Gunk. 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 It's obvious you do nothing to Bert. He thinks of me more as a friend. Uh, you try, Mother. Oh, good heavens. He'll answer if he likes you. Oh, but... Oh, well. Gunk? <laughs> There he is. I see him. Gosh, Mother, you sure got frog appeal. (laughs) Hurry down to dinner, Sue. All right. I'll go on ahead and try to find out what's wrong with D.G. D.G., you're hardly touching your food. I'm just not hungry. Do you feel all right? Oh, I feel... I feel wonderful. You do? Anybody want more vegetables? No, thanks, Margaret. No, thanks. Sue, you haven't touched your Brussels sprouts. What's the matter with them, Sue? Nothing, Mother. I just don't like them. All good little girls eat Brussels sprouts, Sue. (laughs) Name one. (laughs) You haven't eaten any either, D.G. 
Well, I'm not... Do you two kids realize where Belgium would be today if people didn't eat their Brussels sprouts? <laughs> no, where? That's a good question. <laughs> I'll get your tea. Oh, oh, Mrs. Williamson, would you mind if I just rinsed and stacked the dishes tonight? My friend Leonard Frybacker wants to take me to the drive-in movies. Of course not. What picture are you going to see? I don't know. When you go to a drive-in movie with Leonard Frybacker, who cares what's playing? <laughs> well, enjoy yourself. Thank you. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, I, I think I told Judge Grendel I'd go to the movies with him tonight. Well, we can go tomorrow night when Margaret's home. Mother, can I go swimming again tomorrow? Yes, if D.G. will take you again. Will you, D.G.? D.G.? D.G., I'm talking to you. What? Oh, I don't care for any more Brussels sprouts, thank you. <laughs> now, really, what is the matter with you? She's in love with the dreamboat she met at the beach. Sue, you promised. Every time he flicked a muscle, she died. <laughs> Sue! Uh, D.G., you like someone? <laughs> My goodness, why do you want to make a secret of that? Mother, I don't think you understand. I like him a lot, but I'm sure he doesn't even give me the slightest thought. His name is Tommy Trammell, and let's face it, he's an older man. Oh, dear. How old is he? Do you know? He's 15. <laughs> oh. Early 15 or late? Late. I see. It seems so hopeless. That's why I didn't want to talk about it. He probably asked someone and found out I was a mere 13. But you left the beach bag. What did you do? Well, I deliberately left my beach bag. I arranged with Lois to tell him after I left that it was mine, and then she was going to tell him where I lived. I was hoping he'd return it, but she probably told him I was 13 and grabbed him for herself. Tommy Trammell. I think I know his mother and father. They're very nice people. Thank you, Mother, but real honest love has to happen all by itself. Well, I belong to the school of thought that believes in helping it along a little. Come on, let's do the dishes for Margaret tonight. Just a few more and we're done. And then you're off to bed, Sue. All right. Here's the last dish, Dee Dee. Thanks. That does it. Oh, Mother, maybe that's... Oh, Mother. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead and answer the door. Help me pick up the pieces, Sue. Boy, love sure is rough on dishes. <laughs> yes, I'd better start using the old china. Am I going to be goony about boys someday? Mm-hmm. What a future. <laughs> well, I guess we got all the pieces. Let's go see if Tommy's here. Sure hope so. She's been easy to live with ever since she saw him today. D.G., is that... It's your... only Judge Grundle. Oh, what a joyous welcome. It's only Judge Grundle. Hello, Judge. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. Hello, Judge Grundle. Hello, my dear little Susan. I'm going up to my room, Mother. All right, dear. And, Sue, I think you'd better get to bed. You've had a long day. All right. Judge Grundle? Yes? Did you know Mother had frog appeal? <laughs> Frog appeal? Oh, I imitated a frog and her bullfrog answered. <laughs> I went, gunk. <laughs> oh, well, Penny, you appeal to me too, gunk. <laughs> you see? Gee, you're as cute as Bert Lancaster, Judge. Oh, well, that's Bert. <laughs> Bert Lancaster. Well, now that you mention it, I suppose there is a definite resemblance. <laughs> well, maybe you do look like him a little bit. Hey, well, thank you, Susan. I'm delighted you see the similarity. Too bad your mother isn't so observant. You should be glad I'm not because Bert Lancaster is her bullfrog. <laughs> oh. Good night. Good night, dear. I'll be up in a minute. Hey, good night. Judge, I gave Margaret the evening off so we could go out tomorrow night instead of tonight. Would you mind just visiting here? Penny, I'd like to visit here 365 nights of the year. I know, Judge. Judge, Judge, if you'd only call me by my first name, I'd have some hope. But I... Well, try uh... it, Penny. Go ahead. Call me Bessemer. <laughs> oh, Judge, I... Well, there I... you go with Judge again. 
All right, if you only think of me as a judge, let me put my proposal this way. Let me sentence you for life. Oh, dear, but I don't believe in capital punishment. <laughs> well, marrying me would not be capital punishment. It would be life imprisonment. I, I don't mean that marrying me would be life imprisonment. I mean that if you married uh, me... Judge, when I sent it... judge, hmm? you're saved by the bell. Excuse me. Oh, Mother, is that... I don't know, dear. I'll have to open the door first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is this where D.G. Williamson lives? Yes, I'm Mrs. Williamson. I'll bet you're Tommy Trammell. Come on in. Uh, hello. Uh, D.G. left her beach bag and Oh, I... go on into the living room. I'll call her. Thank you. D.G., it's Tommy Trammell. Whom did you say was calling, Mother? He's in the living room. Here she is, Tommy. Uh, hello, D.G. You left your beach bag and I... Oh, it's so nice of you to return it. Uh, have you met Judge Grendel, Tommy? Yes, I have. Uh, is that a ukulele you have there? Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. Ukuleles are back, aren't they? Well, all the ancient things are back, Mother. Jazz, the old songs, ukuleles, the Charleston. Can you play it, Tommy? Well, I'm just learning, uh, but on this far... My dog has fleas. <laughs> Gosh. He's very talented, isn't he, Mother? <laughs> Can you play it, D.G.? Well, I've learned a little. Would you like to go out in the front porch and practice? Well, sure. My, that's just what we used to do. Come on. You know, you seem older now than you did at the beach. Is that bad? <laughs> D.G.'s first boyfriend. My, how time flies. <laughs> D.G. Thank you. Tomorrow night for sure? Oh, of course. Oh, and I'll invite a few of our mutual friends. We can have a Charleston party. You sure you don't have to ask your mother first? Well, I'll consult with her, but I'm at the age now where mother doesn't treat me like a, like a child anymore. Oh, I'm glad you are. I prefer older women. If there's anything I hate, it's kids' parties. You know, with mothers and fathers always hanging around. Oh, I do, too. I'm at the age now where mother trusts me. <laughs> You're keen. And old. <laughs> Thank you. We don't mean to interrupt, but Judge Grundle is just leaving. Oh, I was just going too. It's been swell, D.G. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Williamson. Uh, Judge Grundle. Yeah, good night. Good night, Tommy. Night. Good night. I'll see you tomorrow night at the party. All right. Good night. Oh, what party is that, dear? Well, Mother, could I have some friends in tomorrow night for a Charleston party? But, darling, I'm going out with Horace Wiggins tomorrow night. Oh, oh, no, 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 with me, Penny. Oh, no, I accepted Mr. Wiggins' invitation for dinner and... Holy torpedo. I told you I... Oh, dear. Uh, oh, no, I'm, but, I'm... Mother, it's all right if you go out. <laughs> Mother, I want Tommy to think I'm older than 13. Penny, how could you do this to me? Well, you know my friends, Mother, and if there's parents around, Tommy will think I'm a mere child. Uh, but, Judge, I forgot. And, D.G., I just don't know. Mother, my whole future's at stake. Now, D.G. Horace Wiggins, to think that you could do this to me. Now, Judge. Mm -hmm. Mother, if you do this to me, I just don't think I can go on. D.G., don't talk like that. Go to your room. I refuse to accept the change of plans. I'll see you tomorrow night. But, Mother, I don't care if I ever see you again, Leonard Frybacker. <laughs> D.G., I'll talk to you in the morning. I may not live until morning. Oh, dear. Oh, Mrs. Williamson. Margaret, you're not in trouble, too. It was terrible. We went to the drive-in. We parked where there weren't many other cars. We turned off the lights. I moved closer to him. And then... Sounds all right so far. And then what? Betty Grable! <laughs> In color, too! Oh, what a life. Now for Act Two of the Penny Singleton Show. 
It's early the next morning as Penny enters the office of the Williamson and Wiggins Real Estate Agency. Her partner, Horace Wiggins, is already at the office as Penny enters. Good morning, Penny. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Wiggins. You're in earlier than usual. Oh, I couldn't help it. Woke up this morning at 7, heard the birds singing, saw the sun shining, bounced out of bed ready to tackle a full day. Why, even threw the window wide open and did calisthenics. Then you came right to work. No, I had to go back to bed to recuperate. <laughs> but even so, I couldn't help getting here early, you know. I feel like a million now. Uh, you're early, too. Did this beautiful day do the <laughs> same thing to you? No, it didn't. Between Deejee and Margaret at breakfast this morning, I had to get out early. Oh, Penny, are you going to let something depress you on a beautiful, wonderful day like this? Yes. Well, now, if you weren't depressed, I bet you'd have a different attitude about things. I mean, like, uh... <laughs> well, for example, even marrying me. I would. Well, sure you would. Now, let's tackle each little problem. Clear it up, then you'll start the day with a smile. Now, first of all, what's the matter with Margaret? All the time she was serving breakfast, she kept mumbling, What's Betty Grable got that I haven't got? I hope you didn't tell her. <laughs> Mr. Wiggins, Margaret cuts a very nice figure of a woman. Yeah, but the scissors slipped in several places. <laughs> she had a fight last night with Leonard something or other. Oh, now you know these things don't last more than a day with Margaret. Now, let's tackle the next problem. What is the matter with D.G.? Well, I realize that at 13, everything is a matter of life or death. Mm -hmm. She's just fallen in love for the first time. Well? And it seems absolutely imperative that she prove something by having a small party tonight without a parent around. Since you and I were going out, I didn't feel that uh, that... Uh, was... will, uh, will Margaret be home? Yes. Of course, I know all of D.G.'s friends. They're nice youngsters. Well, Margaret takes care of the children while you work. She'll be doing the same thing if she keeps her eye on the party. I guess I just didn't want to face the fact that Deejee's growing up. <laughs> there you are. All your problems taken care of. Yes. Uh, now then, as I was saying before, about you and me... If oh, we wait, could... there is one more problem, and and this one concerns you. Well, come on, come on, let's, let's have it, get the problem over with, so we can talk about you... Well, I, I got confused and mixed up about dates, and, um, well, um... Judge Grundle's going to be with us tonight, too. Oh. Well, I've told you all my problems, and you were right. I feel much better. And for the first time, I realize it really is a beautiful day. I think it's gonna rain. <laughs> It's all right, Mother? Yes, dear. Let's see. It's almost seven. Mr. Wiggins and Judge Grundle should be here soon. The kids are coming at seven, too. Can I be at the party? Sue, you may watch the party from the stairs. Till 8.30. Okay. 8.30. Mm -hmm. I want my friends to meet her. They think she's cute. Oh, cut it out. <laughs> I'll answer it. Mother, I'm sorry I got upset and childish last night. Don't worry about it. Hello, Sue. Mother's in the living room, Mr. Wiggins. Hello, Mr. Wiggins. Hello, D.G. Hello, Penny. Hello, I'm ready. Just as soon as Judge Grundle gets here. Yes, it's going to be great taking the two of you dancing. <laughs> I'm having a wonderful party tonight, Mr. Wiggins. We're going to do the Charleston. Tommy's bringing his uke, and Jack Randall's bringing drums, and George Stern plays the piano. It's going to be a real Charleston party. It's the thing, you know. That's Judge Grundle. We'll meet him at the door and leave right away. Have a nice time, D.G. Oh, we'll have a super time, Mother. See you later. Oh, my, this is a good steak. Is yours good, Judge Grundle? Yeah. Mr. Wiggins, yours too? Yeah. <laughs> I'm... I'm glad. I think it's fun, the three of us going out together. Don't you, Judge Grundle? Yeah? And Mr. Wiggins? Yeah. I love the Middleton Inn. It's the only really nice dining, dancing place in town. Do you two agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm certainly glad you're both... You're both having fun. I'm having a lot of fun. Well, 
lot of fun. <laughs> that Wiggins, the way he looks at Penny, like a lovesick pickerel. You're um, enjoying yourself, aren't you, Mr. Wiggins? Hmm? Oh, yes. How can I enjoy myself with that habeas corpus sitting across from me? <laughs> what a judge. When he wears his robes, he looks like a black teepee. <laughs> The orchestra is going to play. Uh, but may I, I have, have this dance, Penny? Now look here, Grandma. You look here. I now, was, please, I... gentlemen. Really, I, I, I don't care to dance. I, I really just don't care to dance. <laughs> um, does anyone know what time it is? 9.30. 9.30? Why, we've been here for two hours. My, how the time has flown. Like glue. <laughs> like molasses. Yes, it certainly has been fun. Oh, I'll bet they're having fun at home. Fun at home. Gentlemen? Uh, yeah. what? I want you to know that this has been an evening I shall never forget. I started it, so I'm going to end it. Take me home, both of you. Well, look, everybody, let's try playing the Charleston again. Maybe we can get together this time. They'll never get together enough so we can dance or have fun. Well, we'll try. George, try it on the piano. Tommy, play it on the uke. Give it to me. I can't help it if I don't know it. George, I can't play the drums the way you're playing the piano. George, stop that piano. Well, wait a minute, I was just... Maybe somebody knows some of the old songs. Let's get some life in the party. All I can play is... <laughs> what a party. Well, it's not my fault if none of you know how to do the things you came over to do. I thought we were going to have fun. Excuse me, I think it's Mother. Oh, no, not her mother. Oh, gee. Oh, Mother. I forgot my key, dear. D.G., what's the matter? Sorry about tonight, I... I'm sorry, too. D.G., what's the trouble? The party's just awful. Awful? Where's Sue? She got bored and went to bed at eight. <laughs> Uh, uh, D.G., what, what's wrong with the party? Oh, come in, please. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how to do anything we plan to do. Uh, let's all go into the living room. Kids. Oh, no. <laughs> the party's just dying, oh, and I'm so ashamed that right Mother's just awful. Oh, hello, Mrs. Williamson. Hello, Tommy, Jack, Hi. Lois, George. I guess you all know Judge Grundle and Mr. Wiggins. Oh, oh sure. Oh, 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 yes, we met. We met. Hey, uh... Uh, whose drums are those? They're mine, Judge, but I'm not very good. Uh, what's this old song you were uh, playing on the piano? It's Ain't She Sweet. <laughs> hey, Judge. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Uh, Penny, they were singing Ain't She Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never forget that one. Hey, that's good, Mr. Wiggins. Oh, hit it, Judge. Um, uh, Tommy, let me have your ukulele a minute. Start over, Mr. Wiggins. Okay, Penny. Take it, Judge. Uh. Ain't she sweet? See her coming down the street. Now I ask you very confidentially, ain't she sweet? Oh, great fun. I got <laughs> Gee, I never knew you or the judge or Mr. Wiggins were so good. Oh, good nothing. And that's no banana oil. <laughs> boop, boop, ba doo Oh, Wiggins. <laughs> hey, I never knew old people could be so much fun. Boy, if we could only do the Charleston now, everything would be perfect. The Charleston? D.G., take the uke. You know this one. Uh, judge, you're uh, great on the drum. Horace, you make the piano tingle like Gilda Gray. Oh! Come on, boys, the Charleston! <laughs> Hey. Come on, there, Tommy. Bring it out. Oh, 
Sure was a keen evening, D.G. Well, I'm glad you had fun, Tommy. I sure did. I wonder if... I wonder if I could ask your mother something. Why, sure. Mother! Yes, D.G.? Mrs. Williamson. Tommy wants to ask you something. What? Well, I was wondering if maybe... If maybe when I come over again, you'd give me some Charleston lessons. And me, too. Why, of course, any time. Oh, that's swell. D.G. and I'll be the best Charlestoners in town. Oh, good night, and thanks again. Night, Tommy. Night. See you at the beach tomorrow. Oh, he's a nice boy. Oh, Mother. If only you'd been here for the whole evening. I wish I had been. <laughs> I'm such a fool sometimes. Well, maybe someday I'll learn. All I can say now is thanks for being here. You're welcome, darling. And thank you for having us. You saved our lives, too. For a while, it looked like the judge and Mr. Wiggins and I would end up mortal enemies. Uh, rugs are all back down. Yes, everything's in shape, Penny. Thank you both. <laughs> Certainly had a great time. Didn't you, uh, <laughs> grundle, old boy? <laughs> yes, I sure did, Horace. And thank you, D.G., and thank you, Penny. Thank you for coming. Glad you had fun. Uh, I'll walk away with you, Judge. <laughs> fine, fine, Horace, fine. <laughs> Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night. Hey, she's sweet. The party was a real success. Aren't you glad we had the kids over at the house, Mother? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know which one is the younger, Judge Grundle or Horace Wiggins. <laughs> Singleton Show features Gail Gordon, Jim Backus, B. Benadera, Mary Lee Robb, and Sheila James, with Conrad Binion, Gloria McMillan, and Bobby Ellis. The music was composed and conducted by Von Dexter. The Penny Singleton Show is written and produced by Robert Soderbergh and stars Penny Singleton. Good night. Keep well. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. CBS presents The Beulah Show, written by Charles Stewart. With Jess Kirkpatrick, Eric Roth, Lois Corbett, Eddie Green, and Ernie Whitman. With songs by Carol Stewart, music by Led Gluskin, and starring... Got the world in a juggler. Got the stopper in my hand. <laughs> yes, sir, it's Pula. It's early morning at the Kirk residence, and there's no indication whatever that this is going to turn into a very eventful day. In the kitchen, washing the breakfast dishes as usual, is Beulah, while in the living room we find Jess Kirk and his Aunt Alice. Here, Jess, let me help you on with your overcoat. Oh, thank you, Aunt Alice. Now, do you have everything? Your hat, your briefcase? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, oh, uh, there's just one other thing, Aunt Alice. Uh, would you mind mailing this package for me today? Well, I hadn't planned on going out, but... Hmm, package. Cute little one. <laughs> I feel like a fool sending it. You see, uh, some of the office force thought it'd be nice to exchange presents, so we drew each other's names and... Uh, oh, it's the silliest thing in the world. Everyone I knows. think it's very sociable. Whose name did you draw? Uh, Miss Weatherby. Uh, Letitia Weatherby. Oh, isn't she that little redhead from Rhode Island? Yes, I've nicknamed her Rhode Island Red. <laughs> Well, you better be careful, Jess. She may be after your moolah. My what? You know, your fabulous wealth. Your money. 
Your moolah. Moolah. Somebody bought him for Beulah? <laughs> I know, but now that you're here, we have an errand for you. I trust the cleaning's almost through. Oh, uh, no, ma'am, Miss Ann Alice. You see, I got hung up on the telephone with my gal friend Nettie. And you know how she talks. My, her conversation stretch out like a wet girdle on a clothesline. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Well, Beulah, I just want you to drop this package at the post office, okay, when you go out to shop. All right, Mr. Jess. Oh, uh, fine. Well, I'm off to work, and I'll see you all later. Goodbye, Jess. And watch out for the Rhode Island Red. She may be laying for you. <laughs> Miss Ann Alice, I didn't mean to be on that phone so long, but that Nettie had news that jolted me right down to my foundation garment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, like the man say, that's a jolt, son. <laughs> well, what is it, Beulah? What's happened? Lucius Walters is here in town. Lucius Walters? Is yes. he a friend of yours? A friend? No, that ain't the way Mr. Webster says it. Oh, I see. Sort of an ex throb. Yes, that's the word. That throb covers it perfectly. Well, this is exciting news. Tell me about him, Beulah. Is he good-looking? Good-looking? Miss Ain't Alice, that man was splendor plus. Six feet four of pulsating thought with you. <laughs> Well, he was a big fellow, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. I just barely came up to his lips. But he didn't mind as long as I came up often enough. Oh. <laughs> I see. Never forget how that Lucius liked to go out in a rowboat. There we'd be on the Silver Lake. Moonshine, Lucius smiling, deal of rowing. <laughs> oh, and I remember that straight curl flopping down over his forehead. What there was of it. What there was of it? The curl? No, the forehead. I wonder if he'll come to see me. Say, sounds like you're still carrying a torch for him. Oh, no, Miss Ann Alice. I carried a torch for him for a while, but after I met my boyfriend, Bill, it blew out fast. Bill was sort of a blowtorch, you might say. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh you hear what I say? Look here, a blowtorch. You, you must control those things. Well, Beulah, I suspect you're still more than a little interested in Lucius. Yes. You wouldn't want to make Bill jealous, would you? Well, uh... Oh, ho! Oh. Wouldn't do him no harm, you know. After all, I've been waiting nine years for Bill to take me for better or for worse. All he's been taking me for is granted. <laughs> oh, my, the dope. Could that be Lucius now? Oh, it couldn't. I wonder, though. Shall I answer this, please? That sounds like a good idea. Yes. Kiss me once he kissed me, twice and kissed me once again. Miss Vincent. Oh. Oh. How do you do? How do, mister? How are you? How am I? Well, now, you can just look at me and tell that. <laughs> Yeah, I feel just as good as I am. I feel just as good as I... Oh, no. Oh, no, I must feel better than that. Well, uh, what brings you here today? What brings me here? Well... You see, I came to, uh, uh, oh, shuckings. Maybe it shouldn't have come at all. You mean you don't remember? No, I, uh, oh, sure, yeah. I came to deliver a package. A package? Yeah. Is it ready? Ready? <laughs> Mister, if you're delivering it, you're supposed to have it. I am, huh? Ah! Well, now, maybe that's why I... I've got this string tied around my right finger to remind me. Remind you what? 
Do uh, remember the string in my left finger? And uh, what does that remind you? Look back at the string in my right finger. <laughs> my goodness. Why? Well, maybe because the package is tied to the other end of it. <laughs> oh, my goodness, mister. I think you need a rest. A vacation. A vacation? Oh, now you don't say. Where are you going? Not me. <laughs> You're the one that's going. I am, huh? Well, say, I better get started. Oh, uh, California, here I did. Here I California, here. Oh, dread. <laughs> Probably couldn't get reservations anyway. Bye. Bye, mister. My, that man's brain is a whirl. Why, he could just sit still and go for a spin. <laughs> I want... Well, look at here. He left his pretty package here. Well, let me see now. Here's a card on it, too. Say, roses are red, violets are blue. Forget me not, and I'll not forget you. Sign, L. Dusty. L. Dusty? Oh, only one L. Dusty I know of, and that is Lucius Walter. Oh, Beulah, you enchantress, you. <laughs> Who is at the door, Beulah? Miss Ain't Alice, we has just had a visit from Cupid. Cupid? The card explains it, Miss Ain't Alice. Ma, let me see here. What's in this here box? Roses are red, violets are blue. Forget me not, and I'll not forget you. Hmm. Signed, L. W. Yes, I'm, uh, Lucius Walter. Oh, look here, Miss Allen. It's from him, all right. Gumdrop. Oh, oh. The old flame's still burning. Yes, I'm. And here, I thought that old flame had a fuel shortage long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beulah, what are you going to do now? Well, I ain't gonna do nothing, Miss Ann Allen. Just gonna stand right here in the middle and let fate weave me in his web. Beulah faces life. <laughs> now, here's lovely Carol Sturge singing, You Won't Be Satisfied. You won't be satisfied until you break my heart. You're never satisfied until the teardrops start. I tried to shower you with love and kisses. But all I ever get from you is nagging and dragging. My poor heart is dragging. The way you toss my heart around the cry and change. I'll bet you wouldn't like it if I did the same. You're only happy tearing all my dreams apart. You won't be satisfied until you break my heart. Kind of remind me of the time Lucius and I went to the theater. He kept 
slipping his hand into mine. I kept slipping him them gumdrops. You love, I was wondering... Why, you love. Well, aren't you dressed up? Oh, me? You mean this little old shell pink organdy thing with ruffles and handwork and lace? <laughs> a bit of apple cake? Just uh, something you happened to put on, hmm? Oh, yes. Just happened to. Did you just happen to put those flowers in your hair, too? Flowers? Now, how'd they get up there? <laughs> how'd they collect? I know they didn't grow up there. I know oh. that. Beulah, you don't need to explain. I understand. And you do look fetching. I do, Miss Ain't Alice. Mm-hmm. Oh, me, I hope so. Because like my mammy say, if you want to do any catching, you got to look fetching. <laughs> Beulah, what's happened? Have you heard from me of your boyfriend? Uh, no, ma'am. Bill do any minute, though. So far, I ain't heard from Lucius. Well, maybe he's playing a waiting game. Well, if he's waiting, I'm game. <laughs> Are you going to tell Bill about Lucius? No, I... I think I'll let him find out all by himself. You see, Miss Ain't Alice, in this affair, I'm kind of like the G in MGM. The G in MGM? Mm-hmm. Right in the middle of mm, and uh. <laughs> the eternal triangle. Huh? Well, you better be careful, or Bill's liable to go off and find another girl. Yes, ma'am. I do got to watch out. I don't want that triangle to become a rectangle. Oh, you want to say a rectangle? <laughs> I think I'll be just uh, slightly aloof toward Bill, a little bit formed. That should start him wondering. Oh, me, listen to. There, Bill, now, playing a little back porch piano. Excuse me, Miss Ain't Alice. My ain't as excited. I'm as nervous as a pussycat on ice. Uh, here's Bill, baby. No pain, no strain. Well, good afternoon, William. Do come in. William? Bill is so common. It's always right and proper to say William. Always right, huh? I suppose you'd say, oh, look, it has a duck with mud on it, William. <laughs> Honey, this formality is like you. Do you feel all right? Mm-hmm. Uh, don't I look all right? Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> Put a little ruffled apron, flower in your hair, Why you look like a French pastry in full bloom. Oh, <laughs> oh such pretty flattery. You men are all alike. Yeah, and ain't you women glad of it? <laughs> Will you, um, Bill, why don't you sit over by the table? Oh, no, honey. Sitting at a table without a meal on it is misguided energy. <laughs> Liable to start my gastric juices to flow when you know him. Well, look at here, a box of candy. Candy? Where? Right here, fast approaching my hand. Oh, dear. Bill, I hope you'll be discreet and not read the card that's with it. Card? Oh, yeah, this one that say roses are red and violets are blue. Forget me not and I'll not forget you. Signed, L.W. That's the one. All right, I won't read it. <laughs> What's L.W. stand for? Lost Weekend? <laughs> you understand the meaning of that car? Yeah, no. That LW stands for Lucius Walters. He sent me the candy. Oh, did I? Well, that's mighty friendly of him. Wasn't because he was a friend. Yeah, it can't be because he's an enemy. Uh, wait a minute. Let's call the roll here. What does this mean, Lucius sending you candy? Ain't I your boyfriend, your only boyfriend? Hmm, uh, that's a matter of conjecture. <laughs> Well, leave Conjecture out of here. We got two men in here already. Baby, what does this Lucius mean to you, huh? Oh, me. Oh, but honey, what is the school? Well, I don't know what the school is, but it's a mighty interesting game. <laughs> oh, it is, huh? Well, I'm calling this game right now. I'm going to find that Lucius Walters and hand him a fistful of fives right in the kisser. What do you mean you're going to fight? Over me. That's just what I mean. I'm going to lay him low. I'm going to 
knock him down so much he'll be wearing his uppers lower than his lowers. <laughs> I'm going to flatten him till he has to wear open-toed shoes to see where he's going. <laughs> I'm going to settle this right now. I'm going to settle it by, by, uh, by the way, baby, how big is he? Six foot, oh. Six foot, oh. Honey, on second thought, I think I better settle this by arbitration. <laughs> Now, Les Gluskin and the orchestra play, I Ain't Got Nobody. Something important. Oh, for goodness sake. Come on in, Bill. Sit down. I'll be right with you. I'm just reading a letter from home. Yeah. See, my sister married the plumber. It was a big surprise to me. I thought she was just the plumber's friend. <laughs> hey. Huh? I wish you wouldn't talk about wedding. Oh. That wedding must have been quite an affair. Look, can't you just see him? The triumphant bride and the blushing groom walking out from the church on the archway of cross plungers. <laughs> Eddie, huh? if you don't mind... What, what, what is it? What, what, what's the matter? My gal, Bueller. She done took up with this Lucius Walters. No, I can't believe it. Well, when I heard it, I couldn't believe it either. First, I was dumbfounded. Now I'm just dumb. <laughs> I don't know what course to take. Well, there's only one course open, Bill. You got to dominate that gal of yours. Yeah? Yeah, handle them like I do. Don't let them have their way. Make them have your way. Oh. Let them, uh, let them find out what no means. I think Bueller does that. Well, emphasize it. Eliminate the positive and... Um, accentuate the negative. Forget you ever heard the word yeah. Uh, excuse me, Bill. Hello? Oh, Nettie? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, so I will. I got this. Um. Yeah, honey, of course. I got... Yeah. Uh-huh. What? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Definitely no, I won't. All right, goodbye. Hey, right, see that, Bill? See how I told that gal no? Yeah, you did it good. What did she want? I want to know if I'd be late to take her out to dinner. <laughs> oh, fine. Yeah. Uh, just a minute, Bill. I'll see who that is. Howdy, uh, folks. Uh, Frank's the name. Uh, uh, Franklin P. Uh, Frank. Yeah, well, how, how you do? I'm... Was Eddie Green. 
Yes, what do you know? You talk my language, boy. Or let you and me be friends. Friend, be a, uh, 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 get acquainted. Hmm? Uh, swell. All right, George, we're going to have a nice chat together. I can see that. Uh, well, 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 what brings you here? Why, um, I'm, I'm selling a, a farm, a farm, a, um, I'm selling eggs. <laughs> Do you ra- raise them on your own farm? Yeah, I'll raise them on my own farm. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that, that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how much you charge for the eggs? Well, uh, I've been charging 70, uh, five, uh, seven, uh, 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 60, uh, 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 six, uh, 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 uh,
Oh, well, you wouldn't be interested. Oh, contraire, madame. I'm fascinated. <laughs> uh, did uh, Bueller know about this? Well, naturally. Oh, and that's the funny part. You see, we first thought they were from from a friend of Bueller's. <laughs> well, we had quite a little laugh over it. <laughs> Don't you think that's funny? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, God, you know I've been stabbed in the back face to face. I beg your pardon. Uh, oh, nothing, ma'am. I was just thinking. Well, oh, here's Bueller now. Excuse me, won't you? Hello, Bill. Hello, Lucretia Borgie. Bill! <laughs> What's the matter? Yeah. Have a gumdrop matter, Harry. <laughs> Bill, you know? Uh-huh. Bill, you ain't mad at me, is you? Well, I don't know yet. Oh, Bill, can't you forgive me? I was a foolish girl, I know, and I... Bill. Yeah. I'm standing close to you. Uh-huh. And I got my face tilted up toward you. Uh-huh. And I got my mouth in that certain expression. You know, like saying, crew. Yeah, well, honey, you can hold that there for a minute. Why, Bill? I just put a fresh gumdrop in my mouth. <laughs> oh, doggone it, Bill. You're so mean to me, and I love you so much. But that's why I've done what I've done. Oh, it is? Sure, be. I just want to make you jealous and maybe love me more. And now... And now... Oh, honey, honey, don't cry. And come on here close to me. Oh, it's good to have you back in my arms, so sweet and smelling so nice and... What is that perfume you wear? You like it, Bill? Mm-hmm. It's called Love Flame. Love's Flame, eh? Honey, make way for a visiting farmer. <laughs> Don't forget to be with us again next week at the same time for another half hour with... Got the world in a juggler. Got the stop by <laughs> The Beulah Show, starring Bob Corley as Beulah, comes to you from Hollywood, produced by Charles Vander. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, California, the makers of old gold cigarettes bring you Meet Me at Parkies. Yes, everybody meets at Parkies, so come along to Parkies Restaurant and say hello to Obie Cates and his orchestra, to David Street, Betty Rose, and our genial host, the star of our show, Park Your Carcass. Boy, do I feel good today. This morning I was up at 5.30. Took a brisk walk back in bed at 5.32. <laughs> that exercise stuff is good for you. Well, I get plenty of exercise. For the last 27 years, if anything ever fell down, I always bent over and picked it up. <laughs> After a month or two. <laughs> My doctor wants me to get lots of exercise. Said I should go out and chop wood for breakfast. I tried, but I can't eat that stuff. <laughs> Even with cream. <laughs> Doctor also, he also wants me to get plenty of sleep. Told me to go to bed with the chickens. That's no good. <laughs> I didn't mind crawling on my hands and knees to get into the chicken coop. And I didn't mind the chickens scratching me all night. But when they started to lay eggs all over my chest, that's going too far. <laughs> I'm nice busy here in the restaurant. The whole place is in a termite. <laughs> Everybody's working here today. Painters, plumbers, all because I'm got to make the place look nice because that high-class snooty society woman, Mrs. Vendepeister, is coming over here today. 
to inspect the place to see if we're good enough to cater her affair. Ah, she's a fine woman. She got social position and money and a big house and money. And <laughs> lots of servants and money and beautiful clothes and money. And I understand she's wealthy, too. <laughs> ah, who cares about money? I do. Hello, baby, huh? Hello, Parky. Say, look, I want to talk to you very seriously. Mrs. Vanderpeister is coming over here today to look over the restaurant. And just look at the place. It's a mess. Well, that's because the painters are here. I wanted to varnish the floors and paint the walls. Everything except the ceiling. Why not the ceiling? The OPA takes care of the ceiling. <laughs> well, I hope that when the painters are through, the place will look nice. Well, I got the best painters in town. What are their names? Van Gogh and Rembrandt. <laughs> Oh, Parky, Van Gogh and Rembrandt. They've been dead for years. No wonder they paint so slow. <laughs> Never seen such guys. All they do is stand there and argue. Argue? About what? About what color to paint the walls. And all I wanted to paint it better is plain white. I'm going to the kitchen now, see how they're getting along. I say it is. I say it ain't. I say it is. I say it ain't. Hey, oh. hey, hey, hey. Oh, Van Gogh, you're hopeless. Oh, you're just a silly mule, Rembrandt. Say, excuse me, painter, sir. Ah, Mr. Park, you can't get you. are just the man we need. We were having a discussion as to what colors to use on your kitchen walls. And a man of your royal judgment can certainly help us out. Look, boys, I told you 20 times, don't got to worry about the colors at all. All I want is plain white. But I say a subdued background of aquamarine with a wisp of magenta. <laughs> Look, I don't know nothing about aquagenta. All I want is plain white. Then go, you're impossible. I think a fetching sea of cerise cubits and turquoise. <laughs> Who wants stupid turkeys? All I want is plain white. <laughs> Turquoise threes, when a bewitching heliotrope with a date of a million would be just two, two. I don't want two, two. All I want one, one. <laughs> All I want is plain white. Oh, Rembrandt, you're utterly impossible. But I think we should use pewce and mulberry. But then, go, I thought we agreed to forget about pewce and mulberry in favor of pale shots, roots. <laughs> pewce, chartreuse, what's the use? Listen, you two. All I want is plain white. Mr. Pakakakis, you don't have to shout. Look, boys, could I please have plain white? I still say you don't have to. Plain white? Oh, that's wonderful. Plain white? Sensational. An inspiration, Rembrandt. A stroke of genius, Van Gogh. Plain white? <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Pakakakis. How can we use anything else but plain white? Why did you suggest it before? I didn't think of it. <laughs> but wait a minute. Giving this a little further consideration, are you thinking that plain white will blend with the rest of the place? How, How should, should we know? know? We're, We're colorblind. <laughs> oh, let me get out of here. How do I get mixed up with such crazy people? Betty, Betty. What is it, Barky? I've never met such stupid painters in my whole life. All I want to do is to paint the walls plain white... And they want to paint it in six delicious colors. <laughs> Watermelon, raspberry, cherry, lime, and old gold, and I don't know what. <laughs> look, Parky, Mrs. Vanderpeister will be here soon, and just look at the place. Honestly, I'm really ashamed of the way this place looks. You know, you're right, Betty. You know something? You're the only thing around here that looks good. <laughs> Sing a song for me, will you? Honest, that's the only fun I get out of life. Here, David Street, let this piece of music for you this morning. Oh, let me see it. Hmm, it's a song called There Must Be a Way. Sounds interesting. <laughs> I 
just don't know how to describe how much I miss you. There must be a song that doesn't remind me of. yours used to do. I looked for a way to be happy, happy with somebody new. Bob Williams, I didn't see you come in. I hope you'll pardon our appearance. Oh, it's David Street and OPK. Hiya, fellas. Hi, Betty. Hi, Parker. <laughs> Gee, this place looks like a cyclone hit it. You've got to shake a leg if you want to get it fixed up so that it will look presentable when Mrs. Vanderpeister comes over. Well, you're so right, David. Parky, you hustle up those painters, will you? I'll go over and put the slip covers on the booth. Okay, but I still say all I want is plain white. <laughs> now, Opie and David, you two can go in the kitchen and help the plumber. He's putting in a new sink, and I want you to move all the dishes and that other junk out of his way so he can have room for all these pipes and stuff. Okay. Opie, let's go in the kitchen and help the plumber. Me help the plumber? Yeah. The musician Junior ain't gonna like this. <laughs> Say, Opie, you know, I started to write a story for my column about your playing Mrs. Vanderpeister's affair, and I discovered I didn't have any facts about your life. Oh, everybody knows me, Dave. My brother and me grew up in that town. Really? Sure, well, I'll never forget the time when the teacher kept my brother after school and... They're married now. Uh, I'm afraid I missed a little bit of your story. What did you say happened between your brother and his wife? Well, you see, it wasn't long before they heard the patter of little feet in the kitchen. Patter of little feet, eh? Yeah, you see, this is... You know that to buy mouse traps to get rid of them? <laughs> Say, pardon me, fellas. I'm only a plumber working here, but I couldn't help overhearing what you guys are saying. You know, it reminds me of what happened to me once. You see, I was fixing some leaky pipes in the manhole when all of a sudden... <laughs> and I can show you the marks right on my head today. <laughs> now, wait a minute. That's because you... Say... Do I make myself clear? <laughs> Guy, huh? Well, I met tough guys like you before. Now, before I start pinning your ears back... Pin my ears back? Well, I'll take you and... I accept your apology. <laughs> oh, we look at you and you too, David, standing there gabbing away and there's so much work to do. Well, I was just having an interesting talk with this plumber here. Well, instead of talking, why don't you... Well, I agree with you, Betty, but I can't play that number because I never knew it. Well, okay, then play I Never Knew.
Connie Parkey, come here, all of you. Now, look, Mrs. Vanderpleister is due over here very shortly, and I guess you all know how important it is that Parkey gets this job. Now, we've got to build up this place and make her think that we're a big outfit. Oh, that's easy, Betty. All we got to do is exaggerate everything we say a little bit. Ain't that right? That's right. Now, let's put on the best front we can. Let's really lay it on thick. Let's make her believe that she's dealing with a big institution. And another Uh-oh, thing Betty, I wish you'd... Get a look at that long limousine that just drove up to the door. That's her. Here comes the grand Mrs. Vanderpeister. Well, okay. Now, boys, we can handle this job. Remember, you're as big as you think you are. Now, act big, and think big, and talk big. Oh, come right in, Mrs. Vanderpeister. Welcome to Parky's restaurant. You remember Parky. Hello, kid. And, uh, <laughs> and this is Betty Rhodes, our bookkeeper and cashier. And singer, too. You sing. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Uh, David, would you please see if the chef has those 5,000 sandwiches ready for that small party we're catering? 5,000 sandwiches? Uh, oh, yes, I'll go in and ask him. Five thousand sandwiches. Yeah, and David, don't forget to make out separate checks. <laughs> Pardon me, Parky, if you got a five dollar bill on you, I want to light my old gold with it. Light an old gold. Light an old gold with a five dollar bill. Isn't that unusual? Yes, it is. He usually uses tens. <laughs> Elephants, the Empire State Building and the Atlantic Ocean. Elephants, the Empire State Building and the Atlantic Ocean. Elephants, the Empire State Building and the Atlantic Ocean. What's that? Just out in big, that's all. man holding the clarinet. Well, that's up his tape. <laughs> oh, this ain't no clarinet. I use this for a toothpick. A toothpick? Yeah, I got the biggest cavities in the world. <laughs> How about I do it, Parky? <laughs> oh, won't you sit down, Mrs. Vanderpeister? Parky, please get a chair. A chair? Let's bring her a couple of sofas. <laughs> No, that's just one of our flies. <laughs> Look, Offie, don't overdo it. <laughs> now, Mr. Parker Carcass, you must bear in mind that I'm to have 400 guests at dinner at my yes, party. Yes. Are you equipped to handle that many for dinner? Only 400? That's yes, yes. They wanted me to serve all the congressmen and all the senators in Washington, but I didn't do it because I didn't have time. You didn't have time to serve the congressmen and the senators. Now, you know how long it takes them to pass anything. <laughs> well, I hope the quality of your food is good. With food the way it is today, one can't be too careful, you know. Yeah, lady, I want you to know one thing. In all the years when I have been in the restaurant business, not one person has ever complained about my food. You know what that proves, don't you? What? Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> uh, Opie, you'd better come with me. We've got some work to do in the exporting department. Uh, pardon us, Mrs. Van de Peister, but we're shipping a big order of food to Europe. Come on, Opie. Europe? Oh, Europe. That's it. Mr. Parkey, you know you have an old world atmosphere here. Yeah. This place reminds me of a little bohemian spot I once knew in Paris. Ah, Paris, we, oui, we. Oui. Oh. <laughs> Parlez-vous français, monsieur? Oui. Oh. <laughs> eh bien, vous avez étudié en France? Oui. <laughs> Combien de années habitez-vous à Paris? Oui. Uh, I bet you run out before I do. <laughs> you know, I'm sure I've seen you somewhere. Really? Yes. Have you ever been on the Riviera? Or maybe it was Vieri. It seems to me I've seen you at some romantic watering place. Maybe it was the Tunnel of Love at Ocean Park. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Park, your carcass. I should like to discuss with you the menu for my party. All right. I have a few suggestions here. Here's the list I made out. Now, I think we might start with an antipasto. Antipasto. Wait till I mark that down. Antipasto. That's two words. 
Auntie is uh, A-N-T, and Pasto is P-A-S-T-E. Yes? <laughs> no. I think we should have some anchovies. Anchovies, yes. <laughs> Then we'll have some caviar. Oh, we don't got no caviar. Oh. Well, in that case, I think we should have some sardines. <laughs> sardines? <laughs> of course. Sardines with lettuce. Sardines with lettuce? <laughs> Yolk. <laughs> don't you think you'd like to have some small sausages? Sausages? I never heard such a pronunciation. You probably mean sausages. Sausages? <laughs> of course. Now, what kind of potatoes are you going to have? Potatoes? <laughs> Would you like French Fried or Hash Brun? <laughs> Do you think we can have filet mignon or could we have pheasant under glass? Of course. <laughs> but may I suggest my specialty? Corn boof and kebab? <laughs> <laughs> corn boof and kebab? Oh, you probably mean corn beef and kaboosh. <laughs> kaboosh? <laughs> A kaboosh is an Indian baby. No, you're thinking of papoose. No, I beg my pardon. Now, papoose is like when I ask you to marry me, then I papoose to you. <laughs> oh, uh, Mrs. Vanderpeister, David is about to rehearse his song, and he's going to sing at your affair. It's uh, called Bahia. Would you like to still hear it? Shall we play it for her? Myself talk here. 
Mr. Parker Caucus, would you mind stepping out into the street where it's quiet? Oh, certainly. Let's go out. There. It's much better here. Uh-uh, Mrs. Van Der Be careful of that big hole that they just drilled here. You now, these men are fixing the street with a magnetic drill. Uh, what is it you wanted to say again? Uh, simply this. If you want to pay to my affair, yes. you'll have to do the following thing. Now, in the first place... <laughs> and that's final. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Parky, out in the street. Well, tell me, did Mrs. Van Der give you the job, huh? Well, I'll leave it to you, Betty. This is exactly what she said. She said... <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> Parky gets a job catering Mrs. Van de Peister's party. I'm dying to know myself. So, for the further adventures of Parker Carcass, David Street, Betty Rhodes, Opie Cates and his orchestra, and Mrs. Van de Peister, played by Natalie Schaefer, tune in again next Sunday, same time, same station. Is it a date? Okay, meet me at Parky's. <laughs> Good health to all from Rexall. Yes, it's Sunday. Time for the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Presented by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall family druggist. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, taking a little time from behind the prescription counter this Sunday evening to speak for all 10,000 of us. The 10,000 druggists who have added the word Rexall to our own store names. You can always tell us by the orange and blue Rexall signs in our windows. The sign means that we carry the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. They range all the way from aspirin to penicillin, and they're as fine and pure and dependable as science can make them. We recommend them to our customers because we know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show, written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet, with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, Robert North, Janine Roos, Anne Whitfield, Gail Gordon, Walter Scharf and his music, yours truly, Bill Foreman, and starring Alice Fay and Phil Harris. <laughs> Like most housewives, Alice is concerned about the high cost of living. It's been bothering her for some time, and this morning she's decided to broach the subject to Phil. Phil, can I talk to you a minute? It's about the household bills, and I Honey, please. I have no time for things like bills. I'm a musician. (laughs) An artist, honey, an artist. My mind is filled with nothing but music. Now, if you'll excuse me, I want to listen to this record. What's the name of it? The Warsaw Concerto by Shostakovich. (laughs) You're going to listen to that? Certainly, and if I like the tune, I'm going to sing it on the program next week. (laughs) That ought to be different. Now, look, Phil, I've got to talk to you about these bills. We're spending too much, and it's all your fault. You're too extravagant. Look at this pile of bills from Saks Fifth Avenue, John Fredericks, Hattie Carnegie. Whoops, I <laughs> picked up my pile by mistake. Uh-huh. And I'm extravagant. Well, you are. Look at these bills. Custom-made suits, hand-painted ties, imported shoes, suede shirts. All right, suede... all right. Watch your blood pressure. Take it easy now. Picking on me. How about this bill? $8 for manicures, $15 for finger waves, and $20 for facials, massages, cold creams, and lotions. Are you going to find fault with this one? No, no. Those items are ne- necessities. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. Being in the public eye, I need all them things. <laughs> the 
Besides, I'm not the only one that's extravagant. Look at these household bills. Look at this one from the grocer. Why do we need all these imported cheeses and fancy canned stuff? You won't eat anything else. Oh. Well, how about this butcher bill? Why do we have to have steaks, chops, and prime ribs all the time? That's all you'll eat. <laughs> oh. Well, how about this $40 milk bill, and let's see you tie that one on to me. <laughs> There's no point in arguing. William suggested we cut down on meat. As our business manager, he feels we can save money there. In fact, he's out right now doing the shopping for us. Oh, well, he's doing the shopping. Uh -huh. <laughs> Fine. Ain't that ducky? I can just see him raising Mary Ned because the price of Dutch cleansers gone up a halfpenny. <laughs> Look, Alice, I'll tell you one thing. You'd better come home with steaks because Frankie and the boys in the band are coming over for dinner tomorrow night and they'll be expecting those nice, juicy steaks I always serve. Oh, boy, I can't Good wait. Good morning, Philip. <laughs> well, if it ain't Bargain Boy Faye, the scourge of Safeway. How did you make out, William? Well, I got everything you need for tomorrow night and I... Oh, it was quite a load to carry. I'm all tuckered out. <laughs> well, give Grandma your basket, little red riding hood. <laughs> Come on, Willie, open the sacks. Let me see those steaks you got for tomorrow night. My mouth is watering for some of those oh, good... Oh, Philip, I didn't get steaks. I got something much more delicious. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something better than steaks, huh? What are we having? Creamed codfish balls. <laughs> Creamed cod... Willie, please, don't say things like that. You know I'm a musician and I just got up. I'm in a weak and... <laughs> Creamed cod... Philip, the cuts of steak you like cost $1.50 a pound. Much too expensive. Now, the menu I, I prepared for tomorrow night is excellent. Cream codfish balls are wonderful. They're inexpensive, nutritious, and positively delicious. Thank you, Prudence Penny. <laughs> now, get lost, Elroy. What are you trying to do, poison my friends? With you arranging the dinner, how can it possibly be a success? It will be a success, Philip. It will. I guarantee that after a few cocktails, there. I don't care what... Cocktails? <laughs> Brother William, you may return to the fold. <laughs> All is forgiven. Well, hey, are you sure you got enough to drink for all of us? Definitely, Philip. I got two whole gallons of sauerkraut juice. Is it cold? <laughs> sauerkraut juice? Yes. Isn't it an ideal combination? Oh, Daph, Daph. <laughs> Yes, indeedy. I can't wait to dunk a codfish ball into a puddle of sauerkraut. Really, Philip, I don't know why you're making all this fuss. Alice, do you see anything wrong with a combination of sauerkraut juice and cream uh, codfish? Oh, please, please, Willie. I feel a little faint myself. <laughs> Thanks for your help, brother, but I'll take over from here. Alice, I'll just carry it into the kitchen for you. Uh, shall I leave it on the table or shall I put it in the refrigerator? Just throw it on the floor. <laughs> Maybe the cat will get at it. <laughs> Willie. Frankie and the guys are coming over for steak and now... Come in! Frankie, I don't mind. He's like one of the family. He don't come over just for what he gets to eat. Ah, oh, hello, Frankie. What time do we eat, Curly? <laughs> Frankie, the dinner isn't until tomorrow night. Oh. Well, in that case, I better take off this napkin. <laughs> I could have sworn that you said tonight was the dinner. All right, all right, come on in. You can have dinner with us tonight, too. That's real nice of you, Curly. Frankie, look, I'm glad you came over. Something's got me awful upset. And, well, you're the only one I can talk to. Seems like you're the only friend I got who will listen to me. Yeah, what time did you say we're going to eat? <laughs> I didn't say. I told you that it's still three hours until dinner. You're a little over-anxious, aren't you? Of course not. I didn't come over here just to eat. Then put away the knife and fork. <laughs> Look, Remley. I got some bad news for you. Yeah? We're not having steak tomorrow night. I hope you don't mind, kid. 
No, that's okay, Curly. I ain't particular. I'll eat anything. If I can't have steak, I'll eat something else. What are we going to have? Cream codfish ball. Frankie, come back here! <laughs> now, come on inside. All right, but if you ever say a thing like that to me again, I'll punch you right in the nose. <laughs> Close that door and come on in. You ought to know very well it ain't my fault. Willie says that we're spending too much money on meat and he's going to arrange the menu. Willie, that's square. Suppose that means we're not going to have any drinks before dinner. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, we're going to have cocktails. Good. What kind? Well, we're going to have... Excuse me. What are you doing? I got to bolt the door before I lay this one on you. <laughs> Frankie, we're going to have sauerkraut juice before the codfish balls. <laughs> sauerkraut juice and codfish. <laughs> Curly? What? I hate you. <laughs> I want steak. Stop thinking of yourself all the time. Alice says steak costs her a dollar and a half a pound, and we can't afford it all the time. There you are. That's the trouble with women. They don't know how to shop. Why should she pay a buck and a half? Curly, why don't you do the shopping? You can buy in quantity like a guy I know. He bought a whole steer, and he got it for 30 cents a pound. He had it cut up and packaged, and he brought 30 it. 30 cents a pound. That's all. Yeah. 30 cents. That's all. Hey, I could show Alice. With a whole steer, I could have steak every day. And... Sure. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, what does a steer weigh? Pretty big, Curly. They weigh about 100 pounds. <laughs> about 100, huh? Cost you about 30 bucks for the whole thing. If you want one, I know a guy who's got a ranch and I can get it for you. You can? Uh -huh. Hey, look, Frankie, I'm going to buy one. Look, I can't leave now. You go over and buy it for me. Get the best meat he's got. Have it cut up into steaks and charge it to me. Okay, Curly. I'll take care of everything. Good. Now, you buy the meat and let me know as soon as you consummate the deal. Okay. <laughs> consummate? What's he expect me to get? Soup meat? <laughs> Gee, I wonder why Frankie hasn't called you. He's been gone two hours. Oh, man, I can't wait to get that meat in the refrigerator. Just think, a hundred pounds of nice, thick, juicy steaks all cut up and neatly packaged. And Hey, I bet that's Frankie now. Oh, I can't wait to sink my teeth into those ever-loving fillets. Hiya, Curly. Hiya, Frankie. Well, did you buy my meat? Yeah, I got it with me. Already? Well... Well, don't just stand there. Bring it in. Okay. Come on, bossy. <laughs> Frankie, what have you got there? Your meat. Beautiful hunk of bovine, ain't it? But I didn't want it that way. I wanted it all wrapped up so I could put it in the refrigerator. Okay, get a piece of paper and we'll wrap them up. <laughs> Frankie, I thought we were going to have it butchered and all cut up. Oh, this guy's just a rancher. He doesn't butcher it. Uh, Curly, it cost a little more than I expected. Instead of 30, it cost 40 cents a pound. 30, 40, 30. What's the difference? <laughs> all right. I don't mind that. Certainly it's all right. 40 cents a pound for 100 pounds Curly. is only... Curly? <laughs> what? Weighs a little more, too. <laughs> How much? 1,100 pounds. Eleven, <laughs> huh? Remley, why do you do these things to me? I never done nothing to you. I ain't never kicked your grandmother. I never did what nothing to you. What are you getting excited there. about? What are you oh, getting excited about? Instead of 30 bucks, it's costing you a measly $440. <laughs> Besides that, you got enough meat here for two years. Still cheaper than a dollar and a half a pound. Oh, I guess you're right. But what am I going to do with this animated Bull Durham sign? <laughs> Eat it. 
Eat it. Eat it. Fine. Yeah, yeah. eat it. It's fine. So? I can just see him walking around the dining room table and everybody takes a bite as he goes... <laughs> Eat it. Please, Curly, let's not be ubiquitous. <laughs> Naturally, we slaughter the animal first. Let's take him in the kitchen and get started. Frankie, we can't bring that thing in the kitchen. Well, why not? Alice is a little eccentric. She don't like to have strange stairs running around the house. <laughs> Antisocial, huh? It's none of my business, Curly, but at times your wife is inclined to be difficult. What's the matter with her, anyway? Well, you know how women are. She's just... Oh, shut up! You go! <laughs> Why, if Alice ever saw what I bought, she'd think that I'm completely Bill! off... Bill, who rang the bell before? Hey, it's Alice. Quick, Frankie. Now leave that steer on the porch and come on in and shut the door. Hurry okay. up. Okay. Now, not a word to Alice. She mustn't know that you've Bill, got... Bill, Bill, did someone come... Oh, hello, Frankie. Hi, Alice. Say, you look very well. <laughs> well, the same to you. <laughs> what kind of a greeting is that? Frankie, I... 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 Who, who's that stomping out on our porch, Phil? Who? Oh, that's... Uh, oh, oh, honey, it's my lady harpist. <laughs> What is she wearing, army shoes? What is she doing out on the porch? Who brought her over? Your wife's a nosy little blonde, ain't she? Quiet, will you? Keep quiet a minute. Alice, listen to me. Now, the lady harpist came over to rehearse, and, um, well, she, she didn't want to disturb us, so she's practicing outside. Well, I must admit she's playing it much better this week. <laughs> Bill Harris, I'm going to see who's out on that porch myself. Alice, I wouldn't go out there for... I'm going to see... Ah! Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, Something Phil. wrong, Alice? Oh, Phil, Phil Harris, what is that horrible monster you've got out there? Oh. Huh? Oh, honey, oh, it's... Oh, it's just a steer. What? I bought it to save money on meat. Look, now this way it only costs 40 cents a pound and we'll have enough meat for two years. Yeah, come on, Curly. Let's take it in the kitchen, cut it up into steaks and put it in the refrigerator. No, no. Now, wait a minute. Don't you take that thing into my kitchen. If you want it slaughtered, take it over to the butcher. Okay, we'll take it over to the market. Come on, Curly. All right. Hey. What? Hey, Remley. How are we going to get him over there? Same way I brought him over to your house. Hey, taxi. <laughs> Frankie, you brought the steer over here in a taxi? I had to. The streetcar was too crowded. Cut that out! <laughs> Which reminds me, Curly. You owe me $28.75 for taxi fare. All right, all right. You'll get it. It's only a half a mile to the market. We'll walk it over. All right. Come on, bossy. <laughs> See you later, Alice. So long, fellas. Gee, I'm a lucky girl. It isn't every husband who brings his wife a live steer. <laughs> oh. No. East is east and west is west And the wrong one I have chose Let's go where I'll keep on wearing Those frills and flowers and buttons and bows And rings and things and buttons and bows Don't bury me in this prairie Take me where the semen grows Let's move down to some big town Where they love a gal by the cut of her clothes And I'll stand out in buttons and bows We'll love you in buckskin or skirts that you've homespun. Oh, but I'll love you longer, stronger, where your friends don't tote a gun. My bones denounce the buckboard bounce and the cactus hurts my toes. Let's buy moose where gals keep using those silks and satins and linen that shows. And I'm all yours in buttons and bows. Cause the city's where I feel at home And not the lone prairie My bones denounce the buckboard bounce And the cactus hurts my toes Let's bear moose where gals keep using Those silks and satins and linen that shows And I'm all yours in buttons and bows Give me eastern trimmings Where women are women in high silk hose And peekaboo clothes and French curfew That's 
rocks the room. And I'm all yours. In buttons and bows. Hey, Remley, we're blocking traffic. Can't you get this rump roast to move a little faster? <laughs> Maybe if you got off and pushed it, it'd help. <laughs> hey, Curly, look, we're at the market already. Already, he says, already. Hmm? It's taking us two hours to go a half a mile. Now, let's get off and take him over to meat market. I hope nobody sees us with this Hi, thing. Mr. Harris. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Julius. Hi, kid. Good to see you, Mr. Remley. <laughs> You too, Mrs. Remley. What are you, a wise guy? Mrs. Remley? It's possible. <laughs> I've seen you out with stranger looking things than that. <laughs> All right, you two, break it up. Let's break it up. Hey, kid, where's the butcher that owns this meat market? He's at the market across the street buying lamb chops for his wife. He buys his meat across the street? Yeah, he can't afford to buy it here. <laughs> what do you want with him? I want him to slaughter the stare. So, you're leaving Rexall and going on the beat and eat meat business, huh? <laughs> Mr. Harris. You'll make an excellent butcher. Wait a minute. I ain't leaving Rexall and I ain't going in the neat business either. <laughs> I knew all the time he wasn't that old. Meat business. <laughs> I'm not going in no meat business. I wouldn't know how to butcher anything. I heard your program last Sunday and I beg to differ with you. <laughs> can't slaughter it for you. You gotta have that done by the packing company downtown. Downtown? How are we gonna get them downtown? I'll wrench is my delivery truck. All it'll cost you is 20 bucks. 20 bucks? Hey, Remley, this thing is adding up. Well, we gotta have the truck. Here's your 20, kid. Hey, he's actually got the dough. <laughs> you must have got your allowance from Miss Faye. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't get no allowance from Miss Faye And don't worry, there's plenty more where that came from So long, kid uh, Wait a minute, there's something stamped on this money There is? What does it say? This $20 bill was stolen from the place of Alice Faye Stop <laughs> Hey, Remley, let's get out that packing house We don't slaughter cattle for individuals as a rule, Mr. Harris, but I guess we can accommodate you this time. Oh, gee. Thanks, mister. I'll take the steer. Gee. <laughs> kind of... Kind of hate to see him go. I've... become sort of attached to him. Stop slobbering. <laughs> go on, bossy. Go with the man. Oh, go on, will you? <laughs> this ain't no attitude to take. The man ain't gonna hurt you. Oh, Frankie, how can you lie to the animal like that? <laughs> Let me talk to him. Bossy. I know, I know, I know, I know how you feel. <laughs> but, but that's life. Horns up, old boy. <laughs> You've, 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 you've just got to face these things and, and, and be brave. Mr. Harris, are you related to this steer? <laughs> of course I'm not related. It just, just breaks my heart to have, you, to have you slaughter him and cut him up. Would you rather take him to a mortician and have him laid out? <laughs> 
for crying out loud, let the man take him. Come on, boy. You gentlemen wait here. I'll have him ready for you soon. <laughs> Mr. Harris, your steer has been slaughtered and cleaned. That will be $55, please. $55? But I... Oh, well, I guess it's worth it. I still have 1,100 pounds of prime beef. Not exactly. <laughs> you realize in slaughtering, there's a little waste. Oh, sure, of course. Certainly. <laughs> I expected that. Uh, what does it weigh now? 600 pounds. Six? But it weighed 1,100. What happened to the rest of it? Well, in cleaning, there's a shrinkage. What did you use? A cheap, dry cleaning fluid? <laughs> this thing is now costing me 80 cents a pound. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That, that's still less than a buck and a half, Curling. We'll take our meat, mister. Like this? Don't you want it dressed? No, we'll eat it nude. <laughs> But you can't eat it like this. You have to have it dressed. All right. Oh, that's okay, mister. That's all right. Now, we'll... How much does that cost? Wait! Whisper it to me. Lay it on me lightly. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be too much. We can have it dressed for you for uh, $85. Hey, who's going to dress it, Adrian? <laughs> we'll take it to the Star Outfitting Company. They do a cheaper job. Quiet! <laughs> Leave the man alone. Look, mister, go ahead and dress it and cut it. Anything, just so I get my steaks and chops. Steaks and chops? Don't you want any other cut of the Look, steak? mister, please, don't argue with me. I don't feel too good. Will you just get me my steaks and chops? If that's what you want, very well. Well, Mr. Harris, your steaks and chops are all cut and packaged for oh, you. Thank goodness. Come on, Frankie. Let's get the 600 pounds on the truck before we... Right. Um, hmm? um, mister, uh, we do have 600 pounds, don't we? Not exactly. <laughs> uh, how much? 100 pounds. You only wanted steaks and chops, you know. But only a hundred pounds. I told you steer weight only a hundred pounds. I told... Will you keep... <laughs> Look, mister, let's forget the whole thing. Glue my steer together and I'll take him home, will you? <laughs> Remley, you got me into all this. Buy a steer, save money, 30 cents a pound, enough for two years. Look, I never want to see you again. Mister, give me my meat. I'll take it. Like this? Oh! Oh, I know I'm a sucker for asking, but what now? Well, for this much meat, you'll have to have it quick frozen. You'll need a locker. And for only $120 a year, we can let you have one of our best locks. A locker yet? Look, I just want to eat this steer. I don't want him to join a country club. <laughs> I know he's a pedigreed steer, but do we, does he have to be a social butterfly? But, Mr. Harris... All right, all right. I'm too weak to argue. I'm trying to save money, and now these steaks are costing me over $7.50 a pound. Remley, this is all your fault. My fault? I can't help it if you pay black market prices for me. <laughs> you know something? If I wasn't sick, you I'd be punch you right yourself. in the nose. It's guys like I, you that cause inflation. Me. You At brought a time the like this, it's up to you. You brought a citizen. steer in my house. To keep you had it coming all over. I need you have meat the nerve like I need a whole thing. What are you trying to tell me? Oh, my poor head. I'm so sick. Now, now, take it easy, honey. He'll be all right, won't he, doctor? Yes, he just suffered a shock to his nervous system, resulting in a slight case of high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. All he needs is rest, fresh air, and lots of nourishment. Nourishment? Well, cost me a fortune, but at least it wasn't wasted. I got a hundred pounds of meat to help build me up. Uh, Mr. Harris, one other thing. Yes. No meat for six months. <laughs> Stay tuned to this station for the Edgar Burke and Charlie McCarthy show, which follows immediately. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.